Hey guys, it's Paige. You're listening to Missing Curfew. It's been a great start to the NFL season and it's only getting better at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the NFL. DraftKings is putting new customers in the center of the action with a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes. Get in on the action now. It's simple. Just pick your lineup, stay under the salary cap, and see how your team stacks up against the competition. Feel the NFL action like never before with a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes. DraftKings is a safe, secure, and reliable. And the best part is you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download the DraftKings app now and use code CURFEWKINGS. This week, new customers can get a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes. Enter code CURFEWKINGS to get a free shot at millions in total prizes with your first deposit. Code CURFEWKINGS only at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner in the NFL. Minimum $5 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a fresh new episode of Missing Curfew. I'm Shane O'Brien. And I'm the Updog. And our boy Broadway, Jimmy Scoops, as always, looking down the boys. We are coming to you from Hall Pass Media in beautiful Newport Beach. The Updog, season two of Missing Curfew, my man. It is underway. And what better day to start than the opening of uh, the NHL training camp, baby? Fuck, it feels like, you know, obviously it's been a roller coaster of a month for us here to say the least and thanks again to our listeners and fans but it feels like that first day you get back on the ice remember in the summertime when the fucking wheels are a little tight on your feet eh? you're like fuck i can't get them done up you get out there for 20 minutes like backs tight you're like fuck this up let's go back to the beach eh? oh the groins would always be barking (laughs) soon but i think we talked about this coming in obes i always love this time of year where you get back fresh clean slate you know, what you did or what you missed curfew for last year is swept under the Forgotten rug. Forgotten about. And, uh, you know, you're meeting new teammates today. Us coming in here today really feels like it's the start of a fresh new season, like you said, and a new training camp, a new challenge, new adventures together. And uh, like you said, our boy Jimmy Scoop's looking down, and I'm sure he'd be uh, lacing him up here with us today, oh, yeah. uh, getting ready to rock and roll. He'd be the happiest guy right now because I believe all the fitness testing was yesterday. And we're going to get into some training camp stuff, stuff we love, stuff we don't like. Um, but I know Broadway would be the first guy as soon as that fucking fitness test is over. You're like, all right, bring it on, bring it on. It was always, what was your go-to meal after? For me, it was burgers, fries, couple Bud Lights, maybe an IPA. <laughs> just a, just the time to get the boys together and go, boys, Fitness testing's over. Oh, uh, I mean, for me, as you know, Uppy, I was always battling it to, to try to get to, for whatever reason, coaches were always like, you got to be 230, you got to be under 235, right? So towards the one year, was like, you got to be under 230. If you're not under 230 when you come to training camp, I'm not even going to let you get on the fucking ice. I'm like, all right. He's calling me all summer. I'm like, holy fuck, he's serious. I'm Get to 228. Like, I mean, I haven't had a fucking, I haven't had a carb in a month, right? Get to 228, do the fitness testing, 10% body fat, three mile run. I remember I went for a huge Italian dinner that night in Tampa. I came in the next day. I waited at 228. The next day I was 236. Torch comes in. He's losing his fucking mind. He's like, you're 236 already? What the fuck? I'm like, buddy, I just ate it. I just had an Italian dinner. Like, that's it. I don't want to tell you. Like, I was starving myself. I didn't even eat the gelato. I didn't even get dessert for fuck's sake. So Uh, I always remember, too, like, the lead up to camp when the ice just gets super busy with all the younger kids and then then rookie camp starts right and then the the young kids get to go do their thing and they just get bag skated and play in all these exhibition games but the vets kind of stick around you get the option to do your workout either a couple days before so once i mean once that bike test and once that like that full throttle circle of like you know, high jumps, push ups, fucking <laughs> squats and then like okay if your body can get through that you're feeling good Then it's just like, all right, season's starting up. Fucking boys are fired up. Coaches are just, you know, out there. And then, then like, the wheels start turning, right? And then you're just like, let's just get this thing going. When's October 7th, which is my birthday? But, like, when's that fucking home opener? Let's just get rocking and get up two points. Hey, you bring up that. You tell me of, like, when the young guys start trickling the camp. Remember when we would skate with the Ducks and it'd be like getting closer to training camp and we weren't quite ready to leave just yet. We're like, can we still come here? And Bob Murray's like the guy, like Sean Skane would be like, oh, hey guys, uh, Bob Murray says you guys aren't allowed to skate here anymore. We're like, what? He's like, yeah, there's too many guys here. You guys got to leave. I'm like, well, I guess it's time to go to training camp. Hey, remember <laughs> me, you and Loops would be like, fuck you, Bob. Totally. Like, we're just like, we don't want to leave Newport. We're like, fuck, we got camp isn't for three weeks. So, you know, we'll be there for 10 days before. We'll be yeah, all right. I think I want to actually get to St. Louis right now. <laughs> I don't have a, a country club. I think there. I want to go to Calgary. Like, come on, bud. So, um, 
Updog, you know, obviously Prince, he's done a great job. And there was, there was a couple of clips that I saw the last couple of weeks of, of Broadway and something he talked about a lot was, you know, in Boston when he wasn't scoring, right? They put up the clip where he finally scored the goal. And sure enough, this fucking beauty goes to net, tips one in and he's literally about to celebrate. And he literally takes the monkey off his back. And I just, I had a good laugh with you last time I see it. Like that's Broadway. Like takes one of me the worst situation and turns into something funny. I, I just had a good chuckle over. I would have done that. I would have been just like, fuck, finally I got one. I, I loved it too. Bolesky, we'd laughed about that, uh, you know, last week or the other week. I just, just how funny and how like sporadic Hazy was, like to just create that. But Princey, when he found that, literally, you're like, oh my god, have you seen the video? He actually pulls the chimpanzee <laughs> off the back of his number eleven jersey and like just cruises behind the net, like, whew. If only he could have done that the one time getting his twentieth would have been just epic. Because that monkey, that was a big old monkey. That was, that a, was like that a was gorilla. A gorilla. <laughs> that was that was, that was, was like me being on his back. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't pulling me off, so that one was great. And shout out to Princey again and Bill Burr, the fucking clip of, he's like, I went to the fucking Bruins game last Ray night. Ray Liotta. Duke Rask gets a shout out. Jimmy Hayes, six foot fucking six winger, scores a goal. I'm like, Jimmy! Yeah. And that whole clip was fucking hilarious. And Bill Burr's like, when don't you care when a six foot six fucking monster winger scores for the bees? So that whole clip too was, yeah. was unbelievable. Basically I mean, calling out TD Garden. From now on, whenever Hayes scores a goal, you, everyone's got to yell, Jimmy! Yeah. <laughs> it reminded me of our boy Jimmy James, who we're going to get into too. But uh, both those clips were unbelievable. Princey, great job. And everyone, our listeners, thank you so much. And um, up dog, a guy that's been good to us, Cabby. He's back with Sportsnet. I think it's great for hockey. He's been up there back in Canada at the Jays game, hanging out with Donaldson. Obviously, I think it's great for Sportsnet and for Cabby to be back in Canada. Yeah, a little bidding war for old Cabby back oh, there. Man, he I switched know. over to old Sportsnet from uh, uh, TSN, from TSN, I right? Know. So I, I I love when the good guys get in the bidding war. And then it's always, and I'm not going to say this for him, but it was the case for me, and at one point for you too. But it's nice to be in the overpaid club. Not the underpaid club. Fuck, I've- and I hope our boy Cabby's getting taken care of up there because he's a good guy. And what he brings to the table, I mean, they're trying. So let's be honest. DraftKings, our sponsor. Loves DraftKings. Gambling's opened up in Canada. Cabby Richards is headed back home to fucking bring on a whole new element of sports betting on, on air. And that's, you know, I think Sportsnet realizes it. Um, the whole, you know, Canada's opened up. I mean, maybe not their borders, but their gambling is. And... To me, that's just a, it's an excellent opportunity for Cabby to go bring his personality and bring his, his spice back to, uh, to Canada. Cause he's, he's great with athletes. Uh, he's great on air obes. He's the personality. I mean, they must've missed it cause they brought him back. Um, but he's been down here, you know, he's been doing his stuff, uh, for the NBA and, um, I forget who he was with, but he was he was doing NBA like gambling, like yeah, on he, basically <clears throat> as the game's going, hitting them with lines. Take this guy second half, like take these points, and I, th- I think there's value to that with uh, sports betting. <clears throat> I agree, up. and that's a great point by you. <clears throat> and that's a you know we're hard on Canada sometimes, but I'm glad that they finally realized to do that because everyone, let's be honest, everyone gambles. And you bring up DraftKings, it's unbelievable. And they interviewed a lot of NHL players right now about Cabby being back with them. And like, you could tell how every, it's a gift that he has. Every single NHL guy was like, oh, Cabby, it's so great to have you back. I can't wait for you to inv- invade my personal space and like <laughs> stuff like that. So um, to him, congratulations. I think it's great. I'll be a great point by you on, on betting in Canada. That'll be big for him. So um, Updog, you brought in. You brought in some fucking twigs. I mean, buddy, it's training camp. You can't show up with no twigs. I know. You got fucking some really... I mean, I don't... I appreciate you having mine, but you got a lot of fucking legit National Leaguers. Well, yeah. And for the listeners, the ones not watching on YouTube, uh, our listeners, I brought in what was in my storage unit for probably the last 15 years, Obi. And this... What I have here is probably maybe a, a quarter of the sticks that I've collected wow. and have at my parents' house back in Newfoundland. Hi to Scott and Mandy. Um, Big Scott. And thanks for taking care of all the memorabilia. I can't wait to see it. Is he's pumped. But um, yeah, these, I mean, and every stick tells a story. Our boy Al Hall was like, wow, this, this is incredible. You have everyone from Chris Pronger, legend, to Scott Niedermeyer, legend, Alex Ovechkin, legend, legend, Max Domi, Dreisaitl, McDavid, Carey Price. Carter. I mean, it's a fucking all-star Hall of Fame lineup Solani. of sticks. I, my thing, and, and I'll give credit Brodeur to- Brodeur you got. I, you like to, I collect shit. I, I, I still have an old sleeve of Titleist Bolata balls. I know Bolata nineties. I give you a hard time. You're a bit of a hoarder. Well, fuck. But that's okay. This, but this, this is. I, I'm ex- extremely jealous of this. Yeah. This is a great play by you, and it's something that I never even crossed my mind when I played. 
Like I should have Pronger and Niedermeyer. I play with both those hundred percent. Like I just never, it's super cool that you So I used you to come in the game and I would either ask my trainer to be like, hey, can you ask them for a stick and have them sign it to Uppy? Like yeah. I'm a huge fucking, and a lot of the guys you'll see are Canadians or a guy like Alex Ovechkin. I played against him in World Juniors. Uh, I watched him grow up and now he's almost fucking catching the great one for yeah. goals. Um, you know, and then McDavid. McDavid, I looked up to just when he, when he was 15 years younger than me, skating with him at Biosteel Camp and then having a chance in Edmonton to, you know, to play with him. Um, you know, basically like, hey, I collect six. <laughs> Can you sign me a fucking <laughs> Listen, twig? If push, uh, if push comes to push too and the market goes down, I'm going to fucking sell these things. So. Yeah, I know, but there's two uppy on them. Eh? <laughs> two up dog or two uppy. Um, you could paint over that. Eh? Yeah, I got Yogs. Yogers in there. I mean, the guy's 49, still he's fucking He's just scored goals another fucking check. goal in the Czech League. Crazy. It, it wasn't a bad one either. It was kind of like spink. Spinky. What did he say? He it said, was a garbage goal, let's be honest. He he said, fucking he's like, I got to keep playing or they're going to move the team. I'm like, Fuck, I don't know him as well as you, but I'm like, who cares if he's new the team, Yogs? But he just loves it that much. Loves it. Loves it. So shout out to my boy Frosty again, who avid, you know, fan of the pod and trainer in, in New Jersey. He helped me get all these. Yeah. And not only did he help get these, you should see the stack of jerseys I have. It's wow. retarded. So were these all at your sick pad or where were these? These were in my storage unit oh. next to my sick pad. <laughs> you have your own storage unit. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're yeah. damn right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where am I going to put the Santa Claus setup I bought for the house this year? Rookie of the year in fucking Newport it was, Beach. Yeah, it was full on Griswolds at, at the Upshaw residence. Yeah, so Oppie, I give you a hard time, but thank you for bringing this in and good on you. It's something I wish I would have done throughout my career. And you bring up McDavid at Biosteel. I saw a clip, I believe it was from a couple years ago at St. Mike's Arena. He was doing stick handling at the red, like, I yeah. was like, there was a fucking hundred pucks and he just went. So that, that, uh, that drill that you watched yeah. is a competition we do on the Wednesday of that training camp. And basically they, uh, the skills guys come out and you work with this old Finnish guy. He's fucking hilarious. I can't, I, I don't remember this, but he's a Toronto guy. He's the one that t teaches all the Toronto kids like their s stick handling skills. Um, we, we would be timed. Connor literally beat everyone. And I'm talking everyone from Duclair to... You know, dry settle wasn't in this one, but Domi, like guys that are like fa fast yeah. and quick and great with the puck. He beat them all by like 35, 40 seconds, which is insanity. Not one missed, you know, you talk about efficiency touch touches. Yeah. There wasn't one fuck up the whole way. And his feet are just going <laughs> edge work, edge work, edge work. Didn't even nip another puck, did he? Didn't even nip didn't it. Even the one nip I was it. like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, didn't even I used scrape to do that sides, with like, eh? I, yeah. <laughs> I used to do that with like literally a whole, you could fit four pucks in between my two pucks and I would still. How was the, how was the shaker at the end of that bio still camp? Would you it guys, was always pretty good. Yeah, I bet. And Del Zotto used to DJ at sick party. Gurges would be there, set of it course. up. And, uh, you know, Segs would be there. Fucking, it, it would be a nice little crew. Because you guys had legit national leaguers at that fucking thing. Yeah. Nurse would be there. Subban be there. Um, you know, we'd have Freddie Anderson. We, it was a great, always a great little group of guys. Yeah. And uh, shout out to BioSteel for for throwing that on. It's it's an incredible thing. Matt Nickel, the trainer, does a great job. Um, but it just shows the loyalty to you know the process of getting ready for camp. These guys, these guys come in there and they don't need to be there, but BioSteel puts it on, and these guys just go full tilt like it's the start of their NHL training yeah. camp, and it it gets everyone in competitive mode. Um, it gets your groins out of that like summer <laughs> program into like holy shit things are things they're are barking ready for to rock. A, they're barking for a different reason now. Hey, Alfie, they're yeah. barking for a different reason. Hey, uh, not a shout out to Mike Camilleri. I was playing with Cammy in Calgary, and I thought we were pretty good buddies when Bio Steel was just coming along. No, like hey, Obes, you got you got a one hundred grand to throw into Bio Steel yeah. or whatever. Hey, Cammy, come on, buddy. Private, didn't he? Kept it pretty private, but yeah, I love Cammy. Great company. It just looks like a sick camp. So. Up dog, I had the privilege on Sunday. I've always wanted to go see the new SoFi Stadium. I went to the Chargers Cowboys game. It was a fucking unbelievable atmosphere. The stadium is, besides obviously the one at AT&T in Dallas, it's the best stadium I've ever been to. It's massive. It has an open air feel to it. And it was a great atmosphere because of the Cowboys and Chargers. Good game. But the first thing I thought about as an ex-player and stadium series is, can there be a hockey game in here? Like it's, it's. It's a clear ceiling, so it would feel like you're playing outside, but obviously the weather in California is great. It has an open-door feel, and I thought, it can't be the LA Kings and the Anaheim Ducks. No disrespect to Getsy and the boys, but how about the LA Kings with the New York Rangers, where the New York fans fly in, and you get 90,000 people. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen. If NHL, if you're listening out there, which I'm sure you're not, but I think it would be a fucking home run. The stadium's unbelievable, Uppy, and if you get a chance, you should go up and check it out because it's, it's, it's massive, man. It's massive. Yeah. How about like a mini tournament? Like how about you make the ice in there and you do, 
you know, five games in three days. You could. Because it you is could. something sick. And, and what, what I see is like maybe it's a host. Maybe it's a Montreal Toronto in there. Maybe yeah. it's maybe it's Florida Tampa. You just bring those rivals from all over the you know, from all over the league. Yeah. And they get this mini tournament in the best stadium ever built. How sick is that Oculus TV screen, by the way? Buddy, I had... It, they say it makes the Dallas one look like uh, Game Boy. It is. It fucking... It's so sick, and it's like literally right there in front of it, and it's circling around. It's it's unbelievable. Like Imagine watching porn on it. <laughs> wow. That would, be a, that would be something. Well, hey, I mean, I don't know if we'll let you rent Can the place. I don't know if we'll let you rent the place out. I, I know we're not making enough at missing curfew to afford that, so... Um, and the fucking... Notorious Conor McGregor was there sitting sitting in the suite behind me, just fucking crushing proper 12 whiskey. And then he went to throw the worst pitch in the history oh, of fucking God, for, was What was he say. doing? Take the suit jacket off, Conor. He's, that's his <laughs> look. He wanted to throw it that bad, I think, just for the press. Let's be honest. Yeah. Hey, come on. Who throws the ball in the fucking dug, into the dugout from the fucking you home know, plate? I know. You know who was sitting in front of Conor McGregor at the game and uh, – Beanie picked him out. Was the guy that used to play Steve Urkel? So it was Conor McGregor and the guy that used to play Steve what? Urkel. Yeah, sitting in the suite behind me. Wow, family matters. Yeah, I'm like Beanie. Yeah, he kind of. I did like that show. Did he have him. glasses on? No, he didn't. I actually and she to, recognized. Yeah, him. I That's actually awesome. used to see him when I could go home more often. Up, remember I used to go home every three months. He yeah. would be on a flight going to Toronto if he was doing a show there or whatever. But so I would always recognize him. But yeah, it was Urkel and McGregor uh, and the Notorious sitting in the suite. So. I watched that show every day after school. So did I. Crazy. But I think I want to even say I seen the house it was in in Chicago one time. Wow. I saw the, the house that they used to f like either film it in or just say that that was the house. It, they obviously probably filmed it in L.A., but they, you know, yeah. we did a double check. How that. painful is that guy probably every time he goes somewhere still being called Steve Urkel? It's got to be a little painful. What's worse, that or uh, our boy on, on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Because he hates it. Carlton. Carlton hates it. And he's a sick golfer. I know. But he goes around all those tournaments and they make him do like the chicken dance and shit. He, I, <laughs> I think he just does it because he's getting paid appearance fees. But uh, So to anyone that hasn't been that stadium, Updog, I don't really love live football, to be honest with you, but that place makes it fucking cool. So um, our first segment brought to us by our good friends at DraftKings. Once again, thank you to them for the outpouring support over the last month. They have been unbelievable. They're everywhere in sports. They're amazing. Up dog, it's NFL season. It's week one and two. We're supposed to stay a week for, away from week one or two. I have not. I'm off to a sluggish start. I was Broadway cold there for a bit, but thank God your Buffalo Bills, the Ravens saved me, and finally Aaron Rodgers looked like the Aaron Rodgers of old, and Goff looked like fucking Goff. Hey, bud, put on a pair of gloves. It's raining. Thank God he didn't because they covered, but how have you been doing I know you love Buffalo. How, did you put money on Buffalo to win the Super Bowl? Because I knew you were talking about that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And my first overall pick in my fantasy draft was Josh Allen. Uh, I don't know. You I, took him number one? I just like him badass. He's just a badass. No, you dude. like him. I know. Yeah, I, he's he, like a young fucking Brett Favre to me. He's like, he just stands in there. And then he can sling it. And he's like, runs like a tight end. Like, he, I, I love him. Um but yeah, I, I tuned in. You know, I checked out the lines in the in the DraftKings uh, app, and you know, I took Aaron Rodgers Monday night to go over two and a half touchdowns. So he gets that smart. He he actually was at two at half, right? So I look on the lines again, and I see plus seven and a half for the for Detroit, yeah. and I'm like. Okay, they're playing great. At the how point. do I not take this? They're playing so I, I yeah. doubled down my bet on Aaron Rodgers, who ended up getting like four, four touchdowns. Yeah. And basically, they, I took the Lions second half, and then I'm like, when do you ever bet on the Lions? <laughs> you don't. Have I ever done that in my life? <laughs> but it just, it was, it looked so good. It was, and I was betting, you know, at the time with the house's money. Um, but I just loved it. It's, it, we're back in. My, my Sunday was, was great. I had an afternoon like no one's business. You got a good setup going there. I saw. I saw you got the dock with the TV. I got that the TV around. on the dock that spins around. Can me you and hear my the boy, volume down there? Me and there my boy A Hall. Yeah, we did up the volume so it can hit the boat. A Hall Whoa. comes in off a little fishing excursion. Uh, you know, two weeks ago he brought back a yellowtail over there. Fucking, fucking fish on. I saw that motherfucker. This thing hung down your shorts like <laughs> this was a big I wish boy. I had fifty-five like pounder. That. Uh, so that'll look good. Well, I think we'll put that up here. Just. Just put the fish. Right I want there. some sashimi. A Hall said he's gonna dial some sashimi for the lads, but did you eat it all or what? He gave, brought me a couple nice, nice fillets. Yeah, it was you tasty. You deserve it. Um. So so anyway, got the TV out there, but then you know the Sunday football on uh, you know Direct TV, yeah. whatever the app. Yeah. You can do the triple game on there, quadro game. 
So I have the quad games going there with the red with the red zone, and I get another game going on the left and on the couch with the IPAs and Izzy. Yeah. I can see fucking five games. It's like I'm at fucking Buffalo Wild Wings. Fuck, we might have to do a podcast from there. Maybe that sounds yeah. like a podcast. One hundred percent. Or fuck the podcast. I'll just come over and drink those IPAs That's with right. you. Hey, listen, about the Lions, I was sweating, man. I was sitting on the couch with Beanie, and she goes to bed early. I got the game taped. I watched the first half. Golf looks like a fucking pro bowler, right? I'm like, the defensive guys, get on them. Get some pressure. Like, thank God it starts raining. And he went, so I know what you're saying. I was worried. They looked really good and played hard at Green Bay's defense. And it's something I want to ask you about defense and something. And, like, we're talking about preseason hockey. NFL guys don't play one preseason game. It's, it seems to me, but what I'm saying to you is guys don't know how to tackle in the first couple of weeks. Like, I think it's harder for the defenses to get going. I wonder what the overs have hit in the first two weeks. It's something I'm going to look up and see because that first half of the Green Bay Detroit game, the Green Bay's defense, they couldn't tackle anyone. I was yeah, like, tackle a of, the guy. A lot of penalties. A lot like of penalties. A, tons of penalties where guys still don't. And you know what? At the start of any NHL season, when the, by the time the refs come in and do their safety protocol meeting and they show all the new videos of what hits and yeah. what holds are going to be penalties. Oh, man, yes. And it's always funny because usually like one guy on your team is either throwing the elbow or getting elbowed in these videos. So you always laugh and have a chuckle. Like, hey, rewind that. There's Upshaw taking <laughs> elbow to the chops. Um, but I feel the same, that like these new rules, like the, the, the headshot to me, like when you're going down and a guy's going down with his head, I mean, that's... They tell these guys to try to tackle low, but if you're carrying the ball and you put your fucking head down to your knee, God, where are the guys going to hit yeah. you? So anyway, a couple a uh, couple penalties went against me. A couple went my way, but that's that's all about you know bad beats. There's way beats. too many flags in the NFL. Tons. Way too many. These guys keep your flag in your pockets, boys. Right? Yeah. Um, I'm with you on the tackling though, because obviously we don't want concussions. No hit to the head, same as NHL, but. I saw one tight end make a pass, and the guy like took his knees out. Like I don't want that either if I'm a tight end. So it's it's hard, but um, I up, don't know. Up, if up, you're a tight end, you might as well just just watch. Gronkowski. So you hear what Gronkowski said? Just on, watch him on Eli, and uh, so you know how Eli and Peyton are doing. Yeah, the, did he jump on? Like? He jumped Monday on, night? I guess Monday night, and was like, they're talking about obviously Peyton and Eli are big film guys. And Gronk's like. Honestly, I don't watch much film. Actually, I don't watch any film. I just do what Brady tells me to do. <laughs> I just asked Tom that week, hey, what should I do? He's like, just run here. He's like, okay. And then I just catch the ball. Insanity. I didn't watch much film. Were you a film guy? I I would watch team film, obviously, because we didn't have a choice, but I would never sit down and watch my own game. No, Maybe I, I should have. I started dealing the chips and throwing the cards around and pouring the red wine on the plate. <laughs> I was not a guy to grab the iPad and watch it. And I swear, like, by the end, by the end, they had this app, right? Yeah. It was called like not catfish because that's what the people do online. It was called something. I've been catfished a few times. The people, all, all, all the video guys in the league will laugh if they're listening to this because they know what it's called, and I don't know because I never fucking watched it. But <laughs> when they started handing out they, iPads. I was like, I'm out of here. They could see who logged in and watched the game films. That's a joke. So they could see that fucking rights. They could see that. So they I would pass waves. around. They would say, listen, watch it, and then you know, like. You get the assistant coach that's like, hey, Uppy, you know, I'm trying to help you. I'll just maybe watch the film, <laughs> you know, because because like wink, wink, we're fucking we can see if you're doing it. And the head coach probably wants you to watch it. And I'd be like, yeah, OK, I got it. But I didn't watch it. I, I replay enough of this shit in my head, like good or bad. Yeah. I am consistently thinking about the game in my head. And that's sometimes it's more than enough. I don't want to see what happened on the ice. I already know. I came off to the bench. I looked at my centerman. I said, sorry. Or, hey, I, 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 <laughs> I got bad. that guy. Or, hey, I'll open up next time or whatever the case may be. My video became like interacting with my team or talking about it after the game. It wasn't so much X's and O's because I didn't think hockey was so much of an X's and O game. I agree. And I had this conversation with Grant Garbers, who you know well. as Two of his kids are quarterback at Cal and UCLA. And that's basically what I said about hockey. I go, every like NFL, you'll see the same kind of formations. Hockey... The coaches tell us to forecheck. They tell us the neutral zone. But other than that, there's no real set play. So what happened last night, the fuck up I made, it's probably not going to help me the next night or two nights later because I'm not going to see it again. For me, as a defenseman, up, it was reading the rush. That's what took me you know, three or four years of being in the NHL before I saw the same three-on-two. I saw the four-on-two coming. And that, for me, was, was the hardest thing about playing. But I was never a big film guy. So, Gronk, we're with you. Um, the last thing about NFL football before we move on, our segment brought to you by our boys at DraftKings and girls at DraftKings. Fantasy football up, dog. I'm off to an 0-2 start. 
We got the worst commissioner in the league, Larry Flowers. Larry, Be- make Larry fu- Bettman is Larry his name. Larry Bettman, you fucking call him, which is great. I can't make a trade without him fucking approving it for some unknown reason. My team is called This Guy Fucks against your team. Fuck, what's yours? <laughs> My team is called Fuck Machine Hut Hut. <laughs> and that, I don't know, I've had this for five years now, and I have two championships under my belt. So I just can't switch up the name. And you have a great picture of a rocket hunting the football. You it's, know what that's from? It's a great. Do you remember the Victoria's Secret Super Bowl uh, sure game do. that they did the day before the Super Bowl a couple sure years do. ago? Yeah. Well, that was like prime time. Like hut, she was hutting the ball. She was hutting the ball. Your your name is perfect. Your picture is perfect. It's a great name for a squad. Um, so listen, I think I got to trade in the works with Cody, our boy C Note. I think if the trade comes through, it's for OBJ and Juju. Hopefully Beckham plays this week. If he doesn't, you're going to smoke me. I will bet you a ball of Camus that I beat you. Are you down for that? Thousand percent, making a magnum. Okay, <laughs> easy, easy. I got, I got some. Hey, the I'm, looking, I'm making a bet. I'm looking I got up some at our projections right now. You're projected to beat me. Am I? I think so. Because I'm looking at something right here. Oh, that's week two. You're projected to beat me by week like three. five points. I think right now. Yeah. Oh, Lamar Jackson versus Allen. Uh, that's just a good head to head. Right off. I got off. Lamar Jackson playing against the Lions though, so I'm hoping Lamar he puts Jackson up. solely won me the uh, fantasy two years ago. I know. Like, I took fucking beat Flowers, that little pussy. Flowers? I love how Flowers ups the ante this year and still has never paid his ante on the fucking one from two years ago. Hey, let's play for this much. I'm like, you didn't even pay last time when it was X amount of much. Uh, or whatever. Larry Bettman. Larry Bettman, what a name. DraftKings, thank you for everything. NFL is hot and heavy. Fantasy, keep it going. Up, dog. This is right in your wheelhouse, brother. Music festivals are back. You've seen some live shows. We got Ohana Fest in our backyard in Dana Point. We've been waiting for this for two years because of fucking COVID. We got my morning jacket Friday night. I've been pumping tunes all week, brother. I'm listening to Victory Dance coming in, holding on to black metal. Jimmy, how fired up are you? For anyone that hears us this week in Orange County or in the area, check out the lineup. It's unbelievable. We're going three days. We got a sprinter van lined up. The Newport crew, Up Dog. I haven't seen a live show in fucking two years, buddy. I Crazy. can't wait to see your fucking my morning jacket, jean jacket, oh, and dance buddy. around with you, bud. I can't wait. I think the jacket might have to hang next to the <laughs> next to the Broadway jersey here because it is a fucking it's a jacket. it's a gem. My morning jacket, limited edition, Levi's red tab. Fucking, we'll wait till you see this. <laughs> I thing still think action. you should cut the arms off and make her into a vest, but I know you don't want to do that. No, I might be able to do that. We're on the beach now. I wore the first one at Red Rocks for a double double whammy. Um, this will be my second show in as many months. I went to Rufus Del Sol at Red Rocks. Full dance party. Fucking epic. I needed it in my life, Obes, as, as you need this. Um, my Morning Jacket, Black Pumas, Kings of Leon, which I have seen years and years ago. I think I told this story on the pod, but it was great the one time. Uh, they were coming to Philadelphia Obes, and I'm playing for the Flyers. Loops is there, Jeff Carter, Richie. And basically, I'm I'm going around like asking guys, you guys want to come to this concert? It's at Electric Factory. It fits maybe 1,000 people, 500. And they're like, who? I'm like, it's Kings of Leon. They're like a you know indie band, like kind of rock, but they're up and coming. Guys are like, no, nah, no, it's after the game. I'm like, yeah. I'm like basically telling everyone in that match to not fucking cover the puck or ice the puck or take a penalty because I had to go see this show. <laughs> And it was one of those situations that I've done this numerous times throughout my career where I just, after the game, guys, fucking great game, great game, stick tap, zip the gear off, out the door, saw one of the greatest shows for Kings of Leon that, that you could have seen, you know, until they blew up, which they probably blew up six months later. They uh, sold out the Spectrum after that, which was awesome. Um, so anyway, that's Friday night, Saturday, Eddie Vedder, Spoon. Spoon, so Cold good. Cold War Kids. Spoon, I've been listening to Spoon this week too and last week. They are so good. I can't wait to see them. Cold War Kids. Don't they, you ever? Yeah, they go on at 440. It's, uh, I don't know if I'm going to make that one. But. Saturday? Mm. So Saturday's a full day. You got to get out there. Full enjoy day? It. Yeah, fucking right. Let's get out there. It's a festival, bud. I'm not lying. Hey, bud, full day for me. Like I don't know if I got that in me anymore. I'm not going to lie to you. You're more of a night guy, aren't you? <laughs> and then to top it off, but Pearl Jam on the weekend. That's what I was going to say. Sunday I remember night. the first Ohana Fest we went to, because Eddie likes to surf down here. That's why it first started. He surfs in Dana Point. He opened up this little small festival called a Haunta fest remember there was one stage remember the pissers were all backed up you couldn't piss anywhere it was kind of a shit show but it was cool how small it was and i remember asking you in loops one time i don't know if you guys remember that just popped into my head i'm like you ever think he'll bring pearl jam here 
because it, it was only two nights. It was a Friday, Saturday, and Eddie played Saturday as the headliner. And we were like, I think you guys are like, ah, probably not. I'd never get. And it's gotten that big, and obviously because of COVID and everything. But probably on Sunday night beside the beach. I mean, it's going to be epic play. I'm really looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah, not only that, but it's become so big that Eddie decided to do a second weekend called. Encore. The Fest Encore Weekend. And that's two nights of Pearl Jam with Beck, who's fucking awesome. Um, so, I mean, if you don't get enough this weekend... Bring it on. Come on, baby. Let's go. We're going again next weekend. So, <laughs> next weekend, uh, me, you, Flowers, and Loops are going to go Friday night. I got us all VIPs. And that's after Lupul's uh, member guests that I have with them at uh, Shady Canyon. Shout out to Lupul's birthdays tomorrow. Fucking September birthday. September 23rd. You old fuck, you're 38 like me up. He's the young boy now. So happy birthday to Loop Dog. I text him if you want to play around the golf tomorrow with you, and he, he still hasn't got back to me. So maybe he's saving he's saving that back for the weekend. He wants for the dance moves. Actually, actually no, I think he's got a game tomorrow. Is he playing with someone already? Yeah. We didn't get I mean, the listen, I'm hot anyways. You don't want to play right now, Loop. So happy birthday to Loop Dog. Ohana Fest Uppy. My morning jacket, I will be standing beside you dancing to see that jean jacket go full bore. If you have not seen this band either live, do yourself a fucking favor. You always hear me talk about it, but this Jim James will blow your socks off. It's amazing. So I'm looking forward to that. Updog Ryder Cup week. Uh, we have two guests today. Uh, our second guest is a huge golf influencer. Uh, it's a great pull by you. We'll, we'll get into that later. But what do you think about the Ryder Cup? I'll start off. I've already bet Europe. For the main reason, listen, USA on paper, are they're fucking loaded. They've never had a team with the world ranking that they've had. I took Europe because I believe Uppy, listen, we've all played on good teams. Maybe not as good as the Team USA golf team. But I'm still a big believer that the team room, you got you to gotta want it. You got to, when push comes to shove, when things go the wrong way, you got to lean on each other. And I just think Europe's the better team in that situation. That's why I picked them. Um, you've played Whistling Straits. Talk to me about that. Who do you think is going to win? Um, do you think USA can get over it and just just let their talent win? Yeah, good question. Yeah. So I have a couple things here, but this Ryder Cup is set up to favor, I think, Europe. Um, Whistling Straits. If anyone's been to Kohler, Wisconsin, I actually Facetime Clark. I got a Facetime today from JJ Dunham. Shout out to my boss and Clark MacArthur. They're playing up in in fuck. I, I want to say they're playing Whistling Straits right now. No, they're not. Well, they're, they're in fucking the Kohler. Ryder Cups. There. Or they're playing one of the side tracks. Yeah, yeah sorry. I mean, there's four courses there. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. So they're playing another one. There. So they're bundled up. Like it's it's chilly. It is British Open. It is fucking windy. It is European weather to its finest. There. Yeah. Who does that favor? To me, you know, a long course favors USA, but a windy course missing the fairway course fa favors to me favors Europe. Now. Um, a lot of controversy going into this, uh, you know, going into this Ryder Cup is Team America. You know, they they go on without Phil. Yeah. Team America, fuck yeah. Yeah, that's a great point by you. I just wrote that down. First time in Do two they have decades. Their glue guys? Two times, first time in two decades that neither Tiger or Phil will be on the team. So they were saying on the golf channel that nerd Brandel Chambly and that other nerd Justin Leonard were saying that could be what Team USA needs. Granted, another thing I heard up because of COVID, usually Ryder Cup week in the States, they have a lot of functions they have to do because of COVID. Team USA doesn't have to do that. Perfect. Get to hang out more. But all the things you just said, that's why I think it's going to favor Europe too. I think if the US get off to a good start, they may be tough to track down. But if there's any adversity, like you heard what Kepka said, like Kepka doesn't like each other. DJ doesn't like Kepka. Cantley, no one likes him. I don't know. It just seems to me that, I, I don't know. I just, if they get off to a good start, I think they'll be okay. But some adversity... They may break. Yeah, like, are they the guys, like, you know, high-fiving and tag-teaming and doing all that <laughs> stuff? I don't see these guys being being a group of guys that are that tight. That's what I mean. Like, you, you know? got to be fucking tight. Yeah, yeah tight. like, yeah, I'm just, I'm thinking, you know, we did a shout-out to Alex Steen, who puts who put on an incredible golf tournament for us at Whistling Straits a couple of years ago after the Blues won the Cup, right? And these guys, it was full eight-on-eight. Captain's picks, last day, one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm, I'm going to chirp Bertuzzo right now because, you know, of course, he's the captain, and and Steiner was the captain. Now, Bobo, you know, how's Bob? Ah, they were down. They were down. Bob was doing how, great. How's Bobo's golf swing, though? Is it a little long? Is it a little sloppy? Or how, he, I, it's a long swing. Yeah, he gets so. a little quick. He can bomb it. Oh, yeah. Well, but he hits tall. the three-wood a lot, 
and he pull he can pull the ball like he, he his his miss is the, is the crazy the dreadful left, left, left pull oh, I know so that. they set up this incredible Ryder Cup I mean we did the we did the G4 fucking outfits, Steiner and I. We ah. set up our team. We looked rock star. We looked professional. You know, Bertuzzo and Flowers team, not so much. Well, I'll look at Flowers. So basically, and last day, Bertuzzo has the pairing. He's in control of the pairing. And he's, you know, he got the first pick. We had the second pick. And, and we kind of waited to throw my name out there. He puts me with Flowers. Like head up? Yes. You playing Flowers. Yes. I was, a, I was whatever. Our, you know, lowest handicap. Flowers was not, he doesn't even have a handicap. And all of a sudden, life is his handicap. <laughs> it was like, really? You're not going to let me play Jake Allen or Chris Butler? These guys are great golfers, and you want to go head to head? You you want me to just automatically take the point? So and they were like, yeah. And I'm took like, the dive. so I just put my f- foot right on his neck. I beat him in ten holes. Oh, I bet it was like not. I beat him, you know, nine and eight. So they sacrificed the point, which was which wow. was terrible. It ended up we ended up smoking him, yeah. you know. So we owed the title. We actually all got mugs. So I remember you guys so that was great. But but we had like chemistry there i hope team america for this Ryder cup can can even get half of what we did i mean we stayed in this one hotel we had the we had the full room with like eight we each shared a bed eight rooms it's i guarantee it's where like these guys are probably all staying i, I would think yeah probably you know they stay together yeah and you build that like you know you build that camaraderie and that's how this thing will go the it's going to be a long hard week the weather might be bad it's going to be long days it's not an easy walk um so you're going to see like, all right, who's going to come together? Who's going to win? It's, it's, I love the team atmosphere of this. I do too. And I just think, I think it means more to Europe. I don't think the States really deep down, like you heard what Kepka said, like he doesn't even like the Ryder Cup. He says, maybe that's just him being Brooks Kepka and, and trying to stir the pot and take the attention away from him and DeChambeau. Maybe there's more to it. He's, he's a pretty savvy guy, but uh, I can't wait to watch it. I'm going to watch it all day Friday. Um, so I can't wait to talk to our guests who you got to see how uh, she feels about who's going to win. So up dog, <clears throat> let's move on to some hockey stuff here real quick, fella. Um, you came up with a great segment the other day when we were golfing. Uh, it's presented by our good friends at Good Life. I got my Good Life tarp on. Uh, I'm about to put a new Good Life order in here for fall. I can't wait for that. Uppy, what a segment called Somebody Sign This Guy. You know a lot about PTOs. I know a little bit about PTOs. Going to training camp, it's a tough. It's a tough feeling. We've talked about it. Um, let's just go over some of these guys that are on PTOs, as we should. And boy, you got to really just sack it up when you get this. Uh, when you get this call to go on your first PTO, it sucks. it's kind of like a. You know, I I hate to say it, but it's a. It's like a let's look in the mirror and see if I really want to continue to do this type moment, right? Because it's like, you know, never ever have you gone into a situation not knowing if, you know, you're going to get called into the dressing room or the coach's office and you're going to have to look this guy in the face. And for the first time since you were maybe, maybe first time ever, yeah. like, hey, you, you're not in our plans. You're, you know, you're not going to be on this team. You're going to the jungle. Yeah, you're cut, basically. Like, <laughs> yeah. fuck, when has when an NHL ever been told he's been cut? I, to me, it was like years ago, and I still vividly remember it, when I was like 12 and 13 trying out for these like Northern Alberta teams. Obes. And then I would like cry for the four-hour drive home with my dad, and he'd be like, holy shit. You know, but it, it made me hungry to fucking make the team the next couple of years. But this is like, you know, we're going to mention a few guys here who, who are going – you know, after signing some big tickets and maybe being bought out or just at the point of their career where, you know, teams are just like, listen, we're, we're stockpiled here. You can come to camp and show us what you got, but there's no guarantees, right? Absolutely. I mean, fucking the New Jersey Devils got four guys on PTOs. I don't know any of them. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy VC. Yeah, Jimmy VC. I'm pulling for that kid. He was at Broadway's funeral. He's a beauty. He I is a beauty. He and he's got it. game left. He's Tyler Witherspoon. I know that kid. I play with him in uh, Abbotsford. Good kid. Um, Alex Golchenyuk on a PTO. How many lives has this guy got? I don't know. He must be. He, I actually had beers with this guy in Montreal. He's he's a good kid, but he has had chances every city. Yeah, and he's played in some good. I ones thought he too. played pretty good for the Leafs last year down the stretch. Right? I'm surprised that he. I'm sure they are, he'll sign in Arizona. They'll sign him. Right? They got to probably get to the. Well, he was four. there too a couple of years ago, so they know who he is. It's um, you know, but for him, it's like. Everything's got to work out in your favor now. So if you've never been on a PTO, I speak from, from you got to be doing everything right. Like, I mean, then, and even then, 
and I'm speaking this from my experience, I thought I made that team cold flat in Florida and it still wasn't enough because of numbers, right? They're still like, well, we can't give you a one way. So another tough thing about the PTO uppy is, especially when you're a veteran is like, you know, you're getting through camp. You look at the schedule. You're, you're kind of trying to, you know, see where you're, you know, you're gonna have a rookie party or a team dinner here or team building here. Your family can come watch you play here. You go play the ducks. Like you're on a PTO. You're so focused on God. I hope I don't get that call in the coach's office. Like you just said and said, Hey, we're going to wave you or you got to go down the American league. It's, it's a really shitty feeling and it's, it distracts you from, I believe trying to perform, although I had a good tra training camp. It was always in the back of my mind. You know, you let me crash with you. I was staying with you for training camp. Every day we're talking to the trainers. You guys hearing anything? Like it just, Ugh, it wears on you. And, and you know, fuck. you know more than anything. So to these guys, I wish him luck. Frolik in St. Louis, I think fuck he makes that squad. I think that's probably a good guy. James Neal, I don't think so, just because foot speed. Um, Neal or A, just going to St. Louis. He just loves to go where you went, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, St. Louis just resigns Thomas. Yeah, where's the room for these guys? I, I don't know. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. when My first PTO there, me, Gomez, um, fuck, there was another guy. Like, we all get there and Wasn't we're like, are there? we fighting? No, it was the year before. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm like, do we even have a spot we're going for? And then, but Hitch would be like, listen, I need vets, right? But you're like, but there's no spots. Yeah. So he's just like, just stick with the process. Like, if you show what you got... We'll make room, kind of, kind of thing, and that's got to be in the back of your head. So, but it is like you just said, it's consistent, like mind boggle, and you kind of got to put it out. But no, it's a yeah, great, Neil, it's a, it's a great point by you, real quick, just on the numbers game, because I remember when I was looking at teams, right, with Jerry Joe. Remember, you know, sports corporate saying that whole book of the the guys that got signed, and you look at fucking three quarters of the league or maybe more. You're like, there's no room there. There's just no room. I remember, you know, Getzy wanted me to come to Ducks camp before I decided to go to Florida camp. I'm like, Getzy. You got fucking nine defensemen on one ways. Like, you know, Florida's got, I, I thought six, it was seven. But I mean, like you said, up, you'll go to some, some of these guys will go to these camps and they don't, no matter how good they play, they don't have a chance to make it. You know, like Bobby Ryan in Detroit. I hope, I, know, I hope Bobby does it. But Brian Boyle and Pitt, I don't know. Does he have a chance? Well, he does plays? just because, I mean, Crosby and Malkin are probably, you know, starting. Starting hurt. Right. So Malkin, Carter, Teddy Bluger are, you know, behind. Crosby in this in, in the depth chart, but that's kind of why, you know, they're fitting in Boiler on a on a PTO and and he's I give this guy credit, man. He skated all year last year that's during the lockout, staying ready, going to World Championships. I mean, the guy, you know, and we saw him in uh, in Boston too. He uh, fuck, he just loves the game. I yeah. mean, I love the game too, but it just sometimes your body just fucking shuts down on you. Um, he's a big boy, huh? Boyle, I forgot yeah. how big he was. I saw him at, at Jimmy's funeral. And he walked by me, and I was like, Jesus Christ, you're a big boy. Tyler Ennis, like he had a pretty good year in, in Edmonton. I think Ennis probably makes that Ottawa Senators team, and that's a team, by the way, look out for. They're going to be better this year. Anisimov in Colorado, Jack Johnson, maybe, maybe. It's just I feel for these guys, Uppy. So to those boys on PTOs, good luck. I will go first. I got two guys. Somebody sign this guy. First of all, my UFA is Jason Demers. Good friends with Brad Richardson. Got to know him through Richie. Beauty. Beauty. Good guy in the room. Right-handed D-man. Can skate. Can play the power play if need be. This is a guy. I'm going to throw a team out. That's up against the cap. Maybe we can. Maybe can't. Toronto Maple Leafs. Maybe you get him for fucking one year and $1 million. You lost Bogosian. Um, Jason Demers. Somebody signed this guy. And my RFA. I just gave Ottawa some love. Uh, what's their GM? Doran. Yeah. That's his name, right? Brady Tachuk has not been signed yet. Fucking sign offer this guy. Sheet. Yeah, like do, I, no, if I'm a GM, done, right? it's, I think it's done now. But if I'm a GM and I had a chance to throw an offer sheet at Brady to Chuck, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Uh, I love Matt to Chuck. I love Brady to Chuck. Get this guy signed. Give him what he deserves. He's the future of the team. Up dog. What, Those are my so guys. hard about this? I don't fucking Dude, get what, it, man. Like, he's not asking for Krill Kap Kaprizov cash. Holy moly. That's but, a lot of bananas he got. But it's like you could have an app or an algorithm just spit out what Brady to Chuck's worth and sign the guy, get him at camp, give him the captaincy, whatever the hell. But, just yeah. get him in there. Like, what's well, he holding out for? Why he, don't you, he hasn't even become the man or the player he is going to be? I yeah. mean, Matt to Chuck took him, you know, three, four or five years to really be like an all star in the league. To a guy that you're like, I'll do anything to get this guy. Yeah. And you even said he'd probably end up in St. Louis. St. Yeah. Louis Blues would love to have a guy like that. Brady Tachuk is young. Just 
give him what he needs, put it to rest, make him happy. He's playing in Ottawa. You're going to have to do extra to keep him there. Yeah. In the long run. Maybe he doesn't want to. Maybe that's sign. the thing. Yeah, maybe he doesn't want to do the long term. That's, deal. I hope that's what it is. I hope that, you know, listen, and if, if I was as good as player as Brady, and he's going to be, he could be better than Matt. And I love the way Matt plays, but Brady's bigger and a little bit, I think, probably tougher when it comes to dropping the gloves. Maybe he doesn't want to sign a, you know, an eight-year deal in Ottawa. If that's the case, I can see the problem. But everything else you said about that, like, why don't why doesn't Ottawa want him there from day one? Like, if you're DJ Smith, they had a great second half last year. They built some momentum. I don't think they make the playoffs this year, but I think they're heading in the right direction. And he's a big part of it. Up at the captain, get him signed. And for me, Obes, I agree with you both. Both those guys, like, figure it out, get him signed. Uh, Pedersen for me, Vancouver. Uh, this guy, he's coming off, you know, a so-so year, 26 games, 10 goals, 11 apples, O's, but the guy's dynamic. Whether his, whether his head is in the right place for playing hockey, I know he's a competitive kid. I know that he's, you know, trying to build a brand and who he is, and he should, because I think all young stars should. Let's just get this guy his money. Him and Quinn Hughes now, I think they're, I read this morning, they're both skating in, uh, in, Michigan somewhere, wherever Hughes is from. Yeah, he went to... Pedersen just flew in. They're yeah. going to start skating together. I think they're in Ann Arbor skating because he went to Michigan, uh, Quinn Hughes. So just just figure that out. Get these guys signed. And, uh, you know, Vancouver. I think Vancouver put themselves in a pretty good spot this year. Yeah, they, they need to sign both these guys. Pedersen, I'm with you. He said something in the media about a month ago in Vancouver I didn't like. He said, I want to be on a team that wins and, and I want to win now. Well, be the fucking guy. Yeah. Be the guy. Yeah. You're the reason if the Vancouver Canucks are going to win now, it's you, Pedersen. Get in there for Greener, your teammates, sign your deal, sign a three-year bridge deal. But if you want to win now, you're the Is guy. Is it broke, broken context, you think? Uh, maybe. Because he can't speak fucking Maybe, but properly. I'm just saying, I get it. You want to win now, but you're the best player on the team. Yeah. For them to win now, it's on you and nobody else. Yeah, he is. Yeah. So. And if you want to get paid like it, you better bring it. So Absolutely. You know, and yeah, th- those kind of quotes, Obes, to me, if it's coming from a young kid, sometimes I'm like, you know, this kid's a free agent and yeah. a lot of, you know, media are probably trying to spin it now. That's true. If he does want to get paid and at some point, like a young kid, when your payday comes and you become the guy, there's a lot of responsibility. So be ready. That's yeah. all I say is be ready to, to accept, you know, criticism, challenge to be fucking leaned on by your coaches and GM and fans and your city. So, you know, if you guys are wanting that payday. Just step up. Yeah, especially in a market like Vancouver. But listen, and he's a great kid. I've never met a Swedish kid, that a Swedish guy I played with that wasn't a great guy, right? There's yeah. no bad Swedish people, I don't think, alive. So get it signed. Greener, Canucks, we're pulling for you. Yeah. Up dog, great segment, buddy. Presented to us by our good friends at Good Life. Promo code CURFEW20. Somebody sign this guy. Up dog, um, great segment, buddy. Somebody sign this guy. Someone sign Somebody this guy. Somebody sign him. There's enough money to go around out there, Come right? Come on. Sign the guy. These guys deserve it. Speaking of guys that got signed, um, our boy Daryl Sutter, who we loved, fuck, you told that story of him. I saw the clip come up again of the story when he's on the bus and he's hitting their head. He's like, there ain't going to hit anybody. I'm not going to hit somebody. <laughs> oh, uh, man. He's a, he's a treat. He's up to it again, isn't he? Oh, the way you told that story. He's up to it again. My boy, our boy, Brad Richardson. This guy loves the game. I just hope... That he can play golf when he's done because he seems that he's always getting banged up. But Richie loves the game, loves the game. Good in the face off circle. Nobody better in the room. Trevor Lewis, great guy. Daryl Sutter brings them both in from their LA King Stanley Cup days. And then he adds a little meat and potatoes on the back end with a guy that you played a lot with, Erica Branson. Um, listen, I'm hard on the Flames. I, I, I thought they're at a crossroads. Obviously, Daryl's a guy that's come in there for, for short term to try to get them back in the playoffs. I love these signings. I think I know your answer as well, but you can never have enough guys like this in your locker room. Yeah, it's, uh, listen, that locker room needs uh, a couple guys, and it doesn't, it, you know this, it doesn't happen with just one, but you bring in a couple guys that That's have won true. and that have played for the coach and that they know how to handle, you know, how this coach acts, how he treats players, um, you know, the, the ebb and flow of a full season with them. And quite frankly, that the team needs to be able to look across the room and realize, hey, these guys have actually won, boys. So let's listen to them. Let's figure this shit out. Let's play like let's play like Trevor Lewis. Let's battle for extra pucks. Let's fucking block shots. And, um, 
You know, I think that Richie's the man. I mean, he's he still loves the game. He's uh, he, he stays healthy. He wins draws. Uh, he keeps the puck, you know, out of his own net. Um, it's a great signing. Erica Branson, you know, he's had a he's had been a little bit of a suitcase yeah. the past you know four or five years. But like he's me and you. he yeah. But he's at the point now, and we talked about this with the you know with the PTO guys. It's like you, you got another shot. You're still in the league. You got a deal. You got to go work for it. You got to prove that you can be effective. You know, and Goody's game, Goody's is best when he's just playing simple, man, and he's hitting guys, he's playing hard, and he hits the net, and yeah. he puts the pucks on tape, you know, and then just limit mistakes, Goody, and just be like that beast, man. You're one of the toughest guys in the league, so, you, you know, I, I, I love it. I love the way, I, I actually love the way that that, uh, that shaped out for the Calgary Flames. I think it's a big bonus for him, and our boy Princey will love it. It's a great, yeah, Princey's fired up. It's a great point by you. When you're trying to like, I don't know if the word is change the culture, but you lose Giordano. You can't just bring one guy in. You got to bring a couple guys in to help out to really, because if it's one guy that walks in, you know, yeah, he's a veteran, but you know what it is up. You know, maybe you don't know everyone that well. You can't come in and really do it, but you bring two or three guys with Stanley Cup rings or winning experience. Now they walk in that dressing room as a, as a group of guys and it's like, all right, boys, that's not how you do it anymore here. So I'm pulling for them. I don't think I'm welcomed in Calgary anymore because... Of probably a the way I played when I played there, and then b my my Tuchuk rumor. So I don't know if I could go to the Saddle Dome, which I think is a shithole, ah, anyways. Okay. But Richie, go when they build their new ring. Yeah, Richie, look, congratulations, buddy. Keep going. I'm proud of you. Um, and I think those are just quality signings. So, uh, up dog, our first guest coming up next um, is my buddy Mike Rupp. Rupp obviously played the right way. The Rupp tough guy. He? Listen, man, I didn't even know who the fucking Danbury Trashers were. I was playing pickleball at Big King the other day, and Coop is like, hey, you see this Netflix thing? I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I turn it on. It is WWE on ice. Melee. Yeah, it's Melee. Obviously, the AJ Gallant and Wingfield went on Chicklets last week with Biz, so you obviously saw the Netflix thing. What did you th I mean, holy yeah, fuck. I love it, and us doing what we're doing now, the power of footage, audio, video, like, the the atmosphere that these guys were able to capture from from basically fucking camcorder videos back in the day yeah, in, a, in a minor league and then seeing the ESPN coverage on it and you know Milbury and Steve Levy uh, as owners you know Stuart Scott was talking fuck, about it's just, it you know and you have Hatch and Chelios during the lockout playing for a team <laughs> like I, I mean these are stories that need to be told Netflix congrats on on a on a hell of a series. Um, Marty Finch series, by the way, that followed it up. Incredible. I recommend everyone watch that. It's an incredible story. Um, but fuck, it's a it's a great thing. I, I can't wait to, you know, to ask Rupper just maybe how much cash was in that Louis Duffel bag that oh, he got. Man, it was hilarious. So I'm sitting on my couch watching it with an I got a nice glass of wine going or, or something. And fuck, they're like, Yeah, we gotta bring in a goal scorer. I'm like, they're like Mike Rupp. And I'm like, <laughs> I text Rupper. I'm like, hey, you got to come on with me and up here and talk about fucking. I, I, you went from, you know, scoring the Stanley Cup winning goal to uh, to fucking all of a sudden you're playing, you know. And we went through a lockout. Like, listen, I wish that when I went through a lockout that I would have played somewhere. I was hanging out in California with you, having an unbelievable time. But then, boom, training camp started, and in this case, the season was canceled. That's why Rupper goes and ends up playing. But fuck, you're looking for someone to play. They want to give you a bag of cash. I just thought like the fans were unbelievable. Um, I mean, some of the character in it were, were great. So it's a great Netflix series. Good job. Uh, I'm interested to see what Rupper has to say. And thank God, up all I have to say is thank God we didn't have to play against the Trashers back in the day because I might have had the Trashers flu. I'm not going to lie. Unless there was totally. fucking million dollars in that bag. I don't know if I would have done her buds. Uh, I know. Well, there's a couple guys that we did have to play against at one point, you know, in our careers, like the Marastis and you know, you, play Junior Vince, this guy. This you guy knew is who, a killer. You knew he is a fucking killer. You know who the one guy... I'll never forget. It was my first year playing against you guys in Milwaukee. I had a couple fights or whatever. I'm honest. Kevin, no, well, him too. But Kevin Klein, we're going out for warm up. And Kleiner, who I play with Junior with. Oh, Jesus. Jablonski's out there for warm up. I, I was actually looking for Yabo's name, but he was on our team that He year. was on he your was team. In Milwaukee. He's just, and he's skating around like this. <laughs> and Kleiner comes up to me. He's like, hey, whatever you do, don't fight that Jablonski. <laughs> I'm like, you're fucking right. So I'm not fighting this guy. Like, he was an absolute. Savage. He used to sit before warmups, stare at the ice from the corner, <laughs> and punch the glass bare knuckles and do like shadow boxing. But he'd be hitting the glass as hard as he could, like just like wham, wham, wham. I'm like, 
yo, take take it easy yeah. on your fucking knuckles here. We got a game to play, bro. I mean, and a guy that him and Trevor Gillies, who's one of my favorite teammates, shout, shout out to the train, I call him. Trevor Gillies was a fucking beauty. Him and Yabo were best buddies. They went over to Russia, played together. They fought against each other. Like, that's just the mentality that these guys had. Like, Trevor Gillies, biggest heart in the world. But when they came to fucking playing hockey, he would fight his best friend. Like, I never had that really in me. Like, yeah. these guys were a different breed. Um, Trevor Gillis is one of my favorite teammates ever. So, um, coming up next, Mike Rupp, the Danbury Trashers. Maybe we got to buy a jersey. I don't know, but what a Netflix special. Check it out. Here's Rupper coming at you. Fellas, listeners, a uh, moment. Obi and I would like to thank our sponsors, the Jersey Lab. You can log on to our website, www.missingcurfew.com, and the link custom jerseys. Get on there. The Jersey Lab are making some incredible minted jerseys, Obes. You can get your Missing Curfew jersey now. You log on, and I'm I, on right now. Got so a, are you. I got it hummed up. I got the up dog jersey here. I can see. I get it in blue, white, teal. You can do whatever the fuck you want on here. You can custom log in. Custom sizes. You want to do... You know, one for your little kid, you know, little, little Benny boy, Benny boy, number 99, you get him his Jersey, extra small, put it under the Christmas tree, whatever you want. You want to get your old lady a missing curfew tarp because she always li- listening to you, listen to us, <laughs> whatever the case may be. The Jersey lab is your one-stop shop. If you are looking to get jerseys for your men's league team, I was, I was just let's say. rock and roll, hit them up in the link. Yeah. You can hit us on our Instagram. We'll make sure that happens. We'll get the socks dialed in the pant covers, uh, whatever the fuck you need numbers names these guys will do it all for you uh missing curfew.com slash get your goddamn jersey at jerseylab.com thanks for listening welcome back to missing curfew uh up dog you know we just talked about the danbury thrasher story um you know, I was watching it and, and I'm lucky enough to work with our next guest and it, it, it's Mike Rupp. And when he came on, I texted him right away. I had no idea. So 609 games, Stanley Cup winner, Stanley Cup winning goal, works at NHL Network, television and radio analyst, Rupper, Mike Rupp. Thanks for joining us, buddy. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Hey, you keep saying, I heard you before you say thrashers. Trashers, trashers, like a trash can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. a mobster, so it's trash can. Trashers, <laughs> trashers, fuck. <laughs> I right, listen, dude. I do the same thing. It's uh, the old Lana is Stardust. So no, thanks for having me on, boys. Great seeing you guys, R- Rupper. I got to be honest with you. So me and Updog are big pickleball players now. That's what it's come to, fell. I play pickleball with guys that are a lot older than me, and they still beat me. But my one buddy Chad Cooper was like, "Have you seen the Netflix special on the Danbury Trashers?" I'm like, "I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about, buddy." So, sure enough, I get on my couch, a little glass of red wine, I'm watching it, and it's just Meat Stick Central, right? And then they're like, "We got to go pick up the school score, and the, the NHL has been canceled, and it's Mike Rupp." And I'm like, "I immediately text you, and the beauty that you are." So, just walk us through it. How did it happen from Stanley Cup winning goal to Stanley Cup champion to playing in the U-Haul? Uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, well, it happened during the lockout, right? So you got yeah. the uh, 04 05 NHL lockout, and there was that, you know, there's that trickle down effect, right? Like everybody's got somewhere to play and or trying to find somewhere to play, I should say. And and I was at that point, I, I didn't play that long in the league, but I don't know. I, there's a weird time where I felt like I couldn't go play in the American League. Like I felt like I was going against the Players Association if I did, so I didn't yeah. go there. And I just kind of felt like the season was always going to come around at some point and then when it got canceled i was kind of like uh, <laughs> uh up the creek without a paddle like, what, what the hell am i gonna play you know and uh so i, I got a feeling. phone call from a buddy who's like hey there's this owner of this team in uh danbury connecticut united hockey league and um he's uh want to make he wants to make a splash he wants to win he wants to win uh the cup in, in that league um and he's willing to uh he's trying to get some nhl guys to come play i'm like okay well i don't know anything about this so uh, you know, I picked up the phone and I called him and I spoke to, uh, Jimmy Galante, uh, Galante, and he was, uh, he was awesome. He's had me come in and I watched the, the, the a few games and, or I watched all game, I should say. And, and the brand of hockey was, uh, you know, it was like, ah, I'll come in here and play a little bit. And I had a great setup where I came in. I basically just practiced in Erie, um, and, uh, with, uh, the Erie Otters, uh, my old OHL team. And I just fly in and play every other weekend play a couple games but um that's what i thought it was just going to get my legs moving but yeah. when i got there i saw that there's something else going on and it was <laughs> it was uh it was crazy stuff but yeah no you mentioned that uh ob the 
the intro in this documentary. So, you know, they're looking for a, a, a goal score. And I, this is, I, I didn't get a preview of this, this documentary. I, I watched it when everybody else did. So they start showing the NHL lockout and they're talking about, you know, they, his dad comes to him and I'm not spoiling anything, just says, get me a fucking goal score. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Oh man, I wonder, like, I don't know this part. Like, I wonder who they're going to get. I'm like, looking, <laughs> I'm watching the screen. Like, what, what NHL player are they going after? Then they show my mug on there. I'm like, oh gosh. And then my phone's blowing up from, you know, all you guys know I wasn't a goal scorer uh, when I played in the NHL. So everyone's giving me a hard time on that. But it was, uh, it was, it was fun to be revered as a goal scorer for a moment. Well, you could have fooled everyone watching the show because your first goal, you come in and go absolutely backhand roof yeah. and i'm like <laughs> yeah, yeah they found the goal score they were looking for it i mean <laughs> and and to his credit to the to aj Glenn, you at that time rupper you were a goal scorer you scored the biggest goal the previous year so they went out and got their goal score it's it's kind of crazy the way it shakes out and and so and the other part about it for you know i know a lot of the listeners probably have seen it but then there's probably some that haven't but um so this uh, you know jimmy who um is a a, a trash industry uh um <laughs> he's a big boy in the in the trash industry on the east coast uh he he bought his son who at that time aj was 17 years old uh, a hockey team and he said you're going to be the gm and the president of this team so aj literally was he put this team together and they wanted to go out and they wanted a certain look they were it was a tough team i mean it was like and it literally was slap shot. And uh, everything that I saw there was is like I was back in the 70s and uh, and thinking like what it was like back then. Right. So uh, but AJ was a Devils fan and like his last NHL game was about probably a year and a half before. And that was game seven of the Stanley Cup finals in 2003. And, and I was playing for the Devils. And, uh, you know, that happens in that game that, uh, you know, we won and uh, we won three nothing. I had a, a goal and two assists, and I, so in his head, he's like, "That's the guy." Right? Like, in his head, like he may have not watched another hockey game since then, but in his head, oh, that night that guy was pretty good. Let's get him. And uh, so it was kind of crazy how it all kind of came together. He's like uh, AJ Galante. He's like a, a a young Lou Lamorello in the making. <laughs> hey, after after he brings in the goal scorer, he's like, "See, <laughs> I'm right." How speaking of Lou, how did Lou handle that? Like. So you were part, you, you mentioned this, but you were part of a select group in the NHL at the time uh, that was getting calls saying, don't go to the AHL. Like we got to like separate from the yeah. owners, right? Obi and I, we were too young. We were, you know, we were on our entry level deals. Yeah. We were like told to go to the, you're like, you're going to Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obes, you're going to Cincy. So we had our places to play, but how did Lou handle, you know, you going there for, and I want to ask you what kind of bag they put all the cash yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then how did the negotiations go down? Like, what time of year was it? Was it after, like, Christmas? Like, at what point were you like, fuck, these guys are handing me a bag of cash to come play. Like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, actually, at the time, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't with Jersey. So I was, um, I finished right prior to lockout. I was playing for the for the Yos. I was in Arizona. Oh, okay, um, okay. And so at that time it was, yeah, there wasn't really much communication. Like you said, up it was the same thing. Like I, I felt like I was still a young player in the league. I probably only had 50 to 70 games under my belt. And I was like, I'm not going to go, you know, I don't, I want to, yeah, I'm kind of just following the lead of the veterans. I'm not going to go play in the American league. And, um, so it ended up being, I, I geez, man, I don't remember when it was canceled, but it was late. I, I'd say probably, late January, maybe yeah. early February. Um, so I, I talked to, uh, you know, this, this to Jimmy and, um, you know, you could tell with his Italian accent, but you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking, <laughs> I'm not thinking that what, what, what's down the pipeline. And, um, so I ended up talking to him and <laughs> my, my agent at the time was, uh, was Scott Norton. And, uh, so I go, uh, Jimmy goes, well, how much, uh, what do you want to make? And I'm like, oh, listen, man, like, um, I, I just appreciate the opportunity to come in and play. I'll, I'll pass you off to my agent. He, he handles that. So my agent uh, calls him and then he calls me back. He goes, Rupper, where, the fu where did you find this guy? And I go, what do you mean? <laughs> and he goes, he goes, like, he told me, first of all, like, name your price. And he was like, like, hold on, Mr. Galante. Like, I'm an agent and I, you don't really want to tell me that. Uh, so what do you think, what do you think's fair? And they were kind of going back and forth. And then so my agent Scott goes to me, he goes, um, I, I don't really know what's going on, but like, he wants to pay you cash. 
And I'm like, what? what do you, wait, what do you mean, like, pay me cash? He goes, <laughs> like, I, I literally think he wants to give you a duffel bag of cash. And I'm like, oh, all right. So I guess that would be the first, the first red flag, right? Like, something's different here. But, like, then again, like, think about it, guys. We were thinking back in the um, major junior. I mean, how many of junior teams growing up, like, they guys were getting – paid on the side to go you know i mean there wasn't anything out of the ordinary and you know that and i know the ohl there were some teams out there they were hey give the guy 20 grand here you know he's gonna lease him a car or get a guy a car here and so i don't know i didn't know anything about like what's going on but when i I started putting things together i know when i would fly in to play he's like just look at the calendar you got to play 10 games to qualify for playoffs and we got like 25 games left so i was like every other weekend he'd fly me in to danbury and he'd be like he give me a call and he's like, I'm going to have my assistant give you all your flight uh, itinerary. I'm like, okay, Jimmy. And he's like, so just let me know. What do you want? I'll give you a car to drive when you're in here. You want the Escalade or you want the Ferrari? And I'm like, oh, I'm like, well, Jimmy, I'm like, I never drove a Ferrari. It's in the middle of, uh, you know, winter, winter. In, in Connecticut. So I'll probably go with the Escalade. We'll go with the Escalade this time. So, uh, yeah, man, I was in there and then I just started seeing stuff, man. There's like, uh, the way that I mean, we got treated like gold, but it was literally there was it was like baseball. You're getting hand signs. You're getting gestures from the crowd. And there's a brawl that starts. There's <laughs> cell phone calls going down to the bench. Next thing you know, that guy goes out and, and starts a brawl. I mean, <laughs> we're picking up guys at truck stops that haven't played hockey in four or five years that they're coming and playing one game and just running around acting like idiots. So uh, but we actually had a really good team, too. We had a really good team that could put the puck in the back of the net. So. Uh, man, there's not enough time to, to tell all the crazy stories. The documentary does a great job, but there's so many more. Rupert, that yeah, and you know what, you guys, the, from the, what I saw on the on the documentary, you guys did have a good hockey club. I want to ask you about the fans there, man. From from what I took out of it, like obviously everything you just said is hilarious, and but I did love the passion that the fans had and the way that the, the town or whatever it was right around it. It was it was a great atmosphere, wasn't it? Yeah, it was something unique. For, I, I wasn't aware of it, but apparently, um, New Haven, Connecticut used to have a team and new haven fan base was known as being like just these just just a different breed and they didn't have a team any longer then obviously the nhl wasn't going on so i think what ended up happening you start seeing and and the thing about jimmy too and and it's he built the city he was he was a hero everybody loved him in that town he had he built a children's wing on the hospital he had um, arenas named after him. He had, he had things named after him across the, around the town. He did. He was like almost, uh, he was a hero there. And so when they started making this team, right, where there's just fights, there's eight fights in the game, nine fights in the game, and there's suspensions galore and the team's winning. Now, all of a sudden we start getting Ranger fans that are heading over to Connecticut and they're just, it, it basically was just attracting all the bloodthirsty hockey fans that are out there. And this place was nuts, man. I, I remember our, in the game, I, uh, oh, man, I, I didn't, uh, like, I hit a guy with a hit, and I, he didn't see me coming, and I, I, I got him good. He was, he was out on the ice. And, I mean, you know, you know how it is, guys. Like, we've been in that position on one side, maybe getting hit, but then giving it. And, you know, it's a big hit, but at the same time, like, I want to see the guy get up. Like, I don't, I don't want to see him laying there. He's, yeah. like, just laying there. <laughs> the crowd's going nuts and they throw they throw a body bag on the ice and it lands next to the dude who's knocked out i'm like what is go- I'm like, we're looking at each other on the bench like what is going on here they're they just throwing body bags like it's almost like a concert you know you see hitting beach balls around they're just tossing fucking body bags through the section and uh but they loved it section 102 man they were nuts and uh it was an atmosphere that's for sure so rupper obviously the way you played the game i played a lot of against your buddy you played it the right way, you were a clean player, but you were tough as hell. But when you went to Dan, were, were, did you did you want to fight? Did you fight when you went there, or you just went there to play? Like, how'd that work for you as an NHL guy? Were guys trying to fight you, or you had so many tough guys that you didn't have to worry about it? So I went on, uh, when I was talking, that was all part of the preliminary conversation with Jimmy, and I said, hey, Jimmy, listen, I played in the minors, and I know when a guy, I spent three years in the minors, and when a guy gets sent down from the NHL, like, it's fair, it's it, it, he's a target, right? Like I'm going to go challenge him. Even if at that time when I was in the American league, I wasn't really much of a fighter, but it was my opportunity to, whether it's go one-on-one and try to beat him um, with, uh, you know, playing the game or just trying to fight him. And uh, I just said, listen, I'm going to come there. I want to play. Like, I don't want to come there and just be a target every night. And this is before I knew what the team was made out of or made up, I should say. And he goes, <laughs> he's on the phone. And he goes, 
Michael, I want you to hang up the phone when we're done here. I want you to go on our website and I want you to look at our roster. He goes, let's just say nobody will even look at you. And I'm like, what's this guy? Fuck? I'm like, what's he talking about? So I hang up the phone. I go on the website and you know, this is late January. They're probably 50, 50 some games into their season. They had six guys over 200 minutes in penalties. They had a couple guys over 300. I started reading the names on there. Stephen Pete was there for a cup of tea. Yeah, that wow. guy's a killer. You remember, you remember Garrett Burnett? Yeah. Garrett I, Burnett was there. Uh, I look on here, and I never I never knew him, never played against him. I, I wasn't um, playing pro hockey at that time, but I heard it through the underground ways, and I'm sure you heard it up you through the Philly. Frank the Animal by a Lois yeah. was, was a guy who played there. <laughs> like, like I mean, all these guys, there's Nasty Morasty. Yeah, um, that's insane. Geez, I, it, I mean, you can go uh, room in the door. I mean, these guys, the you know, Nigerian nightmare. I mean, they, these are, <laughs> we joke around guy, about we, we joke around about these nicknames, but like these guys had nicknames in the fighting part of the world, right? Like that underground hockey fight. And, and so I go on there. I'm like, yeah. So when we go play, and um, we'd be playing against a team, and the other team was built like a team would be in 2003, four or five that during that time. Maybe we had one tough guy, maybe two. And we get out there in warmups, and I play against some of these guys in the OHL or even in the American League, and they won't even make eye contact. They won't even at the warmups. They won't even look across the ice because we've got eight guys here who get treated like gold by our owners, and they know they got to fight. So they're <laughs> drooling over who, who's going to get to them first. So, uh, no, I didn't have to do anything, man. I really didn't. It was fun. I got to go out there, and you guys saw I scored a couple goals. I got to go out there and play, and it was a great time. Yeah, you bring up Garrett Burnett, who I did see on the documentary, him in a couple pictures. It was my first training camp ever, Rupper, and Garrett Burnett walks in. And I'm like, obviously, he's just fucking. And Garrett's a good guy, but Dude. he's just jacked. Oh, I, I don't know what he's. And he goes, before my first exhibition game, he puts the flex all over his body and then just takes the flex all and just starts, starts dumping it in his mouth. <laughs> it, starts, it starts eating the flex all. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, I don't have to fight guys like this, do I? So, and, and you mentioned how many tough guys you had. And this guy was on Chicklets. Uh, he got hurt, but was that Brad Wingfield guy? Like, was he a good yeah. teammate or what was he like? Because he just seems like. I mean, holy so boy. Winger, yeah. So Winger was like, I know when I got there, um, he already had his broken leg at that time, so I never got to play with him. Yeah, but he was right. around the yeah. team. I saw him with his, you know, his leg all, you know, he's on crutches and all that. And I remember talking to Jimmy and, and AJ, and they were talking like he was. It, you know how you you come across coaches or GMs or whomever in the business where there's players that like encapsulate who they are. Right. And they love them. They love them. This is like if the Galante family produced a hockey player, it would have been uh, Brad Wakefield. Mm -hmm. Like, and he was an animal and he was tough as hell. He can play too. He was a really good player um, on that team before he got his leg broken. And uh, which is a, a whole nother yeah. part of that documentary. <laughs> that was, was crazy, man. And, yeah. And uh, so, so Winger was there and he was cool. Like, yeah, talking to him and stuff, but it was, uh, you know, I didn't get to see all that. So that's why watching this documentary was cool for me to see some of these things. But, you know, I, I, uh, it's, I knew that there was, you know, for example, there was a, a situation where Barry Melrose and Steve Levy owned the Adirondack team. And um, somebody, you know, that was, it was the talk of minor league hockey at that time where, you know, there's a there's a group of people that were saying this is an embarrassment to hockey. There was another group that were like, this is the best thing since slap shot in the '70s <laughs> with the Broad Street Broad Street Bullies. And so it started getting some garnering some attention. And Barry made a comment, and I talked to Barry when, uh, when I worked with him and at the NHL Network a couple of times. And it, he, we laugh about it now; it's hilarious. But Barry made a comment um, on I don't know what it was on some platform or, or radio, and, and said they uh, yeah these guys down in Danbury have got Tony Soprano running the team. <laughs> Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy told me this and he goes, nobody, you say something like, you know, nobody talks about us like that. And, and we're going to, we'll, we'll take care of that. So he, they made like a vow every time they're, we're playing this Adirondack team, it's going to be a shit show. And so, like I said, I gave them a schedule like every other weekend. So I'm on, I'm doing a three and three in Michigan. We're jetting around Michigan on the bus and I'm laying, I got my head against the window. You guys know this play. And I got my head against the window sleeping. But, you know, the seat behind me is right here. John Morasti is the seat behind me. And he's leaning forward on his cell phone. And he starts talking, like, very, like, trying to be secretive and talking quiet. But he's talking literally right in my, my ear. No one else can hear, but he's whatever. You know, yeah. He thinks I'm sleeping. 
And I hear this one-sided conversation that's like, <laughs> he goes, he's calling, I put it together later, he's calling Chad Wagner. I don't know if you know who Chad Wagner is, he's a Western boy. I think he's from, uh, I think he's from outside Edmonton or something, and he's been banned from a, at least one or two leagues prior to this. He hasn't played hockey at this point in four years. And uh, so the conversation, Nasty goes, uh, hey, Wags, it's Nasty. He's like, what are you doing, buddy? He's like, uh, what do you got going on next weekend? And he's just, you know, I don't hear anything for a second. He goes, ma'am, we need you to come in and play a game uh, in uh, Adirondack or come in uh, to our team and play a game with us next weekend. Oh, no, no, bro. They don't. I know. Listen, man, I'm not in shape either. I know you haven't played in four or five years. It's cool. They don't want you to. They're like, he's like, fuck, dude, they don't want you to play. They want you to come around, run around this. The owner of the other team's been running his mouth butter owner. They just want to send a message. Just come in here, run around, get on a plane, go back home, make some bucks. And uh, so I'm, I get off the bus and I go to a few of the guys. Like at the end of the weekend, I go, hey, I, I'm not here next weekend, but <laughs> boys, keep me posted. What's going on? <laughs> Something's going down. And uh, so sure enough, this Chad Wagner flies in. I think he hasn't played hockey in, the, like they said, four or five years. He, uh, I think he played three games, had three shifts, and seventy nine minutes in penalties. Yeah, he got yeah. expelled. He got kicked out of the league. Up, so. got, I got him got pulled up here. Right here. Got I got him stats. pulled up, Rupper. He had three games, seventy five pims for you guys. But he's a San Diego Gulf legend, I guess. And Obi played for the Gulf. Is he? This well, this guy fucking. I'm looking at his stats. Each year in San Diego, 45 games, 503 pims. Four, <laughs> 43 games. 521 pims. Fi, uh, fi, oh, That's they, hard they, to do. Robert. Now he, he had a year in uh, Asheville for the Asheville Smoke. 58 games. He he managed 10 snipes and 463 pims. <laughs> this guy's a fucking legend. You know, He's from Calgary. You know, you know, you know your team's in for one when John Morasti. And everybody knows nasty when yeah. he's calling someone to come in and do some damage. <laughs> and we and like that's the thing. You know, one of the other things that uh, Jimmy came up to me at one point. He goes, "Michael, what do you think of Donald Brashear?" And I'm like, "Whoa, I mean, what do you mean? Like, yeah, he's an NHL guy, man. He's yeah, a big boy. He's, he's tough as nails." And he goes, "What do you think about bringing him in? What if I bring him in?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, Jesus, whatever." And, he, and I'm like, "But just you know, Jimmy. I mean, we got nine heavyweights, but." <clears throat> Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> How many do you need, Jimmy? If, no one's going to fight Brash. They won't fight. Like, no one wants to play our team. You know what I mean? So, like, I, it ended up not working out. But, uh, man, they had this appetite to go out and get some boys. I mean, listen, Rupper, it, it was a great story. And when I saw you attached to it, and, and you're a beauty. And, and the one thing at the end, though, about, you know, Winger, the guy you were talking about, Jimmy walks in the bar, and you can see how emotionally was about it. So, for people out there that thought it was a gong show or whatever it was, it obviously meant a lot to guys like that, to the community. Um, a very unique story, my man. And the fact that you were part of it and we do some work together, um, I, I thought it was hilarious. So we appreciate you taking some time. I wanted to talk to you before we let you go. Um, you do great work with the NHL Network. The New York Rangers, we love Gerard Gallant. He's been on this podcast. They pick up Sammy Blaze, Ryan Reeves, uh, good role from Tampa. As an ex-Ranger, you must love the direction they're heading in after what happened last year. I love that they got Turk in there in general. I think that's the biggest acquisition that they made. Um, I love what he brings. I had him in Columbus. Uh, I think it's really important. And in, in, in my opinion, when you can have a coach that you play for and um, you can get more out of you and your team. And I think that, that Gerard's always done that. And he makes you listen. When I was in Columbus. We were god awful. We were terrible. We were out of the playoffs by December one. Or he was an interim coach, but I, we all played for him. He has this uh, ability, and we saw him do that in uh, in Florida. And that, we know how that kind of he got the the shaft there, and then he got the shaft in Vegas too. He deserved better. I mean, this yeah. guy's a a great coach. Guys play for him. That's what that team needs. They need. They got all the talent. They've, that talent is there. Now it's all right. What, what are we going to do moving forward? There's only one puck out here. We got to start building a hockey team. And I think Gerard's a perfect guy for that. But they, yeah, the guys they go out and get, I, I love Sammy Blay. He'll hit everything that moves. We know what Revo does out there. Um, uh, they got Tenorti. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that's a big thing that they, they were missing. And uh, I think what happened, I don't know what you guys felt last year, but when that stuff was going down and Tom Wilson – Man, I'm part of that Tom Wilson fan club. I love Tom yeah, Wilson. Yeah, me too. And uh, but it, it got you know when you're watching that, 
it, it, you know, it gets you your adrenaline going. I got to start sweating. Like who's going to do something, you know, and no one did anything. And I, I think the Rangers, it's, it's time now for them to take that next step. They need to come together as a group. And I think when they have guys that are willing to fight and stand up for one another, that uh, that'll take them to the next level. Fuck. Maybe they got the pre-tape on that Dansbury, Dansbury trashers, <laughs> Netflix series. <laughs> hey, before free agency, it just got slid. So under someone's desk and say, fucking take a page out of this, you know, out of this book. Because they definitely needed the toughness, uh, like you guys just said, and they addressed it. And Turk, I mean, he's just the man. Congrats, yeah. congrats to him. I'm really looking forward to seeing him uh, MSG behind the bench for the blue, and, the blue shirt. And we talk about toughness a lot. Me and Uppy talk about it throughout the course of last year. You saw it with Tampa Rupper. Rupper, me and you talk about it on NHL when we worked together with Cools. The days of fighting, even the days the way you played the game where you, know, you went out, you could play, you fought other heavyweights, that's gone. But you still need toughness. And I think Tampa proved that. And I think that's why the Rangers went out and did that because they realized, Rupper, you need that not only to protect your teammates, but to still win the ultimate goal. Yeah, I know. And I, and I think even if you take the, the fighting out of the equation um, to some degree, like you need, you just need to be able to play an ugly brand. You got to be able to play all different kinds. Um, you got to have a diverse lineup that can do anything. And Tampa was that and is that. And that's why we've seen them win back to back titles. So it's like, you know, you can sit there and, you, if you just played an all heavy game, it's going to be tough to win nowadays. Yeah. But if you're playing an all skill game, it's just as tough. It's just as tough. You know, you got to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, for every guy that you have that that on your team that doesn't block a shot consistently, you need a guy that's gonna, uh, a guy to offset that that blocks it with his teeth consistently. You know, and you got to offset all that stuff and have those guys. So um, I, I just find that you know that's something. Even though to, that's what the, the, you guys both played the game hard and and were were, were stand up guys in that too. But you, I think you guys would probably agree that I always found that I, I always try to. You always get fans and, and people that say, "Well, you know, for an example, Sidney Crosby got his concussion at the Winter Classic when I was in Pittsburgh." Okay, so that's something the Pittsburgh fans always bring up when they say that they need toughness to get people off Sid's back, and they're like, "Well, they had Eric Goddard, Mike Rupp, Derek England." You know, blah, blah, blah. During that time, that happened to Sid. That's not – you can't just pin it on one thing. This is – my point is when you're going into a game and everybody wants to get noticed, everybody wants to stick, and when you go into a game and there's no accountability for any of it, you never have to answer to it because the rules don't even make you think about having an answer to it. Now all of a sudden you've got 18 skaters on that team that are brave. Maybe there's only four guys on that team or six guys on that team who actually had the – you know, had the sack to go out there and, and do something to stand up for it. Now you've got 18. So how is that going to be for your superstar now to go out there and just, you know what I'm saying? Like everybody Absolutely. wants to get noticed. So if you're not scoring goals, you got to do something. Yep. And uh, so I always found that that's a, a way just to kind of, it's not going to get rid of it, but it'll slow it down. And I, and I still think there's a place for it. And I, I do think it slows down some of the, the shots taken against superstars. I agree with you. Um, I can't wait to uh, go at Cooley, me and you, throughout the course of the season. We always go old school. I'm cool as wants every penalty called and McDavid to get 400 points. So we got to keep him. <laughs> we got to keep him under wraps, Rupper. Um, thank you for doing this. Great job on NHL. Good luck this year. And I'll, I'll be talking to you, Rupper. So thank you. Awesome, Fuzz. Good talking to you. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Rupper. Up, Dizzle. You fella, fella, what? fella, fella, Hockey's fella. He's around the corner. Summer's, you know, winding down. It was quick. Fall. We need some new gear. It's that time of year. Good life, baby. I'm on the Good website, life, Obes, baby. right now looking at the early fall essentials. And this company, through thick and thin, these guys have been our sponsors and our friends. Good New York brand. Just opened up another flagship uh, store in New York City. But get online now www.goodlifeclothing.com look at these new tri blends i mean if this the, i mean the guy looks like he fucks on here too but t-shirt oh, club hair, subscribe subscribe to the t-shirt club get 20 percent off for the women out there for your for your ladies you got the new fall arrivals these girls love this material obes the colors are mint but you're right they got a nice little cream uh pattern coming out look right at now these hoodies man look at these double layer hoodies Are you kidding me it is mint so to all our listeners out there, 20% off, uh, promo code CURFEW20, and uh, some great things coming up in the good life uh, world, and we'll be excited to share them here in season two of Missing Curfew. So I will be getting the Loop Terry hoodie in XXL, and I'm going track pants too. I will be in New York in November 
for our boy Chris Shupp is having a little hockey tournament. You will be there with me. Yes, sir. I will be going into the Good Life store As to witness I. it. These guys are great. Check it out. Promo code curfew twenty. Welcome back to Missing Curfew, Updog, Ryder Cup Week. We talked about it in our rundown, which I love doing it with you. I'm on Team Europe because I think they got the, the, the morale and the, the tighter the locker pants. room. They got tighter there. pants. They got tighter <laughs> pants. Better tailors too, right? That European pants, their tailors are always just perfect. Potty Harrington, the Irish guy, you have an unbelievable guest, uh, a woman that I followed for a long time that has a way better golf swing than me and looks better than me for sure. So who do we got, Updog? This is a great pull. Yeah, without further ado, uh, from Scottsdale, joining us today is a girl, a professional golfer turned sports media personality with her own show now called Playing Around, dubbed as the world's most popular golfer, Obi. Wow. With over 3 million. More than me and you. With over 3 million Instagram followers. And also the world's hottest golfer that we can probably both attest to. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Uh, She should have been on the cover. I'm not sure if she was or not, but she should have been. Uh, from Scottsdale, Paige Spranick, thanks for joining us on Missing Curfew. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm blushing. I mean, what an intro. <laughs> uh, well, Thank you, because we were nervous. We've been sitting here for like 15 minutes being like, we better not butcher this one. With hockey players, we don't care, Paige, but with you, we wanted to really do it well, you know? No, you guys nailed it. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So we just, you know, it was a lot of hockey talk today, and, you know, and then we get into the golf. And on this podcast, it goes everywhere sometimes. Sometimes it's music. Sometimes me and Obes get going on our on our you know our tournaments at Big Canyon Country Club here, which which we'll talk about in a bit. But um, it's nice to talk golf. And what better person to have on today, uh, you know, with you? So can you tell us when you started playing golf? How old were you? Uh, I think you grew up in Colorado, right? I did, yeah. So I got into golf a little later than everyone else. I was a competitive gymnast and I wanted to go to the Olympics, but I got injured pretty bad a couple of times and I was too tall and there was just so many factors against me. So my dad was like, this is perfect. I can get her into golf now. So I started when I was 13 and I loved it right away. Like I hit the first shot. I was obsessed with it. I uh, played a lot of junior golf, played in college and then a year professionally before I switched over to doing all my media work. Yeah, I mean, my dad, Paige, my sister, Katie, God bless her. She's a, a, a mother of two now. But my dad would, like, try to force her to play golf when she was younger, right? And I'm like, Katie, like, you got to look big picture here. Like, so she never did. Now she's like, I wish I would have stuck with golf. I'm like, I know I told you to, to, there was a bigger picture to it. But everything you do for the game is amazing, Paige. I've been following you for a long time. I got to ask you, first of all, what's your handicap right now? I just want to see how many strokes I would get off you. I'm curious. So I don't actually keep, like, a handicap anymore. Oh. Uh, when I was playing professionally, I was at a plus three. So Ooh. I just tell people I'm a scratch now because it makes it easier. Yeah. Um, but I'm playing better now than I was when I was playing professionally because I have no pressure anymore. And I give myself like five footers. I'm like, that's good. I don't need to put it out. <laughs> um, I haven't made a bogey anymore since I, you know, quit playing. So I just pick up. Uh, no, but like my game's better now. But I just tell people I'm scratched. Just because yeah. again, I, the whole like plus handicaps and it, people get so confused with that. I think, yeah, sometimes when like guys are plus twos, I'm like, they yeah. just play a scratch. Like. Totally. I wish. Now you're calling the book on me now. Now, <laughs> uh, now that I, I creeped into the pluses, he's like, he's checking the, the GIHN I, app on Paige, me. Paige, this guy's so good. He hits it so far. I mean, I, I'm a six right now, so I got I take six strokes off you. Um, you played your college golf at SDSU. I played hockey for a year in San Diego. I went to that campus. How was that experience? And where did you guys play your college golf in San Diego? Yeah, so we played mostly at the farms. Um, It was a beautiful golf course. Absolutely loved it. The only problem was that it was like 30 minutes from campus. So I spent half of my time in SDSU just driving back and forth between practice and getting back to where I lived. Uh, But I loved it there. I mean, it was probably the best place I could have possibly been to go to school. You had the beach and I had like the most fun ever. And all the golf courses there are amazing. Our team actually ended up being really good. Um, When I came in, we were not ranked. And then when I left, we were a top 20 program and we won conference championship and the men's team. Um, is always really solid. Xander Schauffele, who's playing in the yeah. Ryder Cup. He was on the team when I was there. So, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Paige, I got to be honest. I was like, how old was I? Like 33 years old. Uh, my career was winding down, but I would like put on a backpack and go walk around campus. Just I never went to college, so I was like, ah, I'm gonna, and the, the campus is so beautiful. <laughs> I saw a couple concerts there at the outdoor yes, venue yeah. they have there. I'm like, if I did go to college, if I could have got in, that might have been the spot because the campus was amazing. 
Oh yeah. It was such a beautiful campus too. It's just, the only really bad part was that when you go like downtown, like drinks were so expensive. So it's not great for like a college <laughs> student, uh, but it was still fun. <laughs> Have you seen any concerts at that campus, by the way? Um, none that I can actually remember. <laughs> yeah, well, we, I mean, you had a good time, Paige. Totally. Yeah, I had a good time. College was fun. <laughs> we we seen a we seen a couple shows there, but one in particular that we uh, we're going to see again on Friday here at the Ohana's uh, Festival, My Morning Jacket. So, uh, yeah, a great venue, and Obi, there's more reasons than one why you should have been going to school. At, yeah, they didn't believe I was a student even with the backpack. They weren't buying it. <laughs> Uh, Paige, where in um, in your career, wildest place golf is, has taken you? Like, obviously, when you started out with college and and into professional, um, you know, into your professional career, and then leaving it to kind of take on more of a media personality. Like, what's what's some of the wildest places golf has taken you? Because it's a uh, obviously a worldwide sport, and you know, I can only imagine some of the you know requests and stuff that that uh, <laughs> people around the world have have asked. So where's Paige? Where's the wildest place Paige has been? Uh, I would say probably playing golf in Dubai. I've been there now four times. Um, but just the experience that I've had, I was lucky enough to be on Tiger Woods' team. They did like a celebrity event and he was my captain and Nick Jonas was my partner. And it was just such a surreal moment for me. And then I played uh, another event where Justin Timberlake was my partner and we were playing against Gary Player and Mark Wahlberg. And it was mortifying on the first tee. They were going through like everyone's accomplishments and it was like Grammys and majors and you know, all of these like uh, incredible things. And and then they're like, I, and uh, Paige Sprannick was in a bathing suit on a magazine in Sports Illustrated. And that's it. Like it was horrible, um, but it was like one of the coolest things ever. And like getting to play with like Justin Timberlake, who is one of the most like down the coolest guys I've ever met. And just like, we were partners and he would just like high five me. And I was like, is this my life? Like, is this what I'm doing now? Um, but you know, just being able to like play golf in so many different places, amazing golf courses, meeting all these people. I like never expected any of this. And so, I mean, I've done some really cool things and it's still, I pinch myself like every day. Yeah. Yeah. Paige, and I'm going to piggyback off Oppie's question and maybe this is the answer to it, but when I, I remember watching you, you know, become famous, when was your first time? Like, wow holy fuck, I'm famous. Do you remember when it was? Was it then? Like, or are you just all of a sudden like, I'm famous now? I still like don't feel that way at all because um, I never wanted this. I feel like some people, they like seek fame out or it's either through like their athletic accomplishments. And so um, this kind of all happened to me. I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do after college and I was like, do I want to play professionally? Do I just want to like get a real job? And so I was trying to play professionally and out of nowhere, someone wrote an article about me. I ended up going viral and I went from like a thousand followers to 50,000 followers to a hundred thousand followers. And I was just like sitting in uh, my parents' like basement as like a 22 year old, 23 year old crying in the field position because I'm like, what is happening? Like, I don't want this. Like I'm, you know, really like introverted, shy person. And so I just like never expected any of this. And so even when I'm out on like the golf course, I get to do these fun events and people come up to me. I'm like, why? Like, I'm, this is weird. Like, how do you know me? I just post like cleavage <laughs> shots on Instagram. How did this become this, you know? So it's, uh, so I don't feel like I'm famous. I don't think I'll ever feel like I'm famous. And it's just, uh, I'm just like so lucky that I get to do what I get to do. I mean, call, call it what you want, though. You have influenced the game in yes, so many ways. You have. And You've made golf better. Yeah, totally. And and you bring light to, you know, to people just, you know, catching in on their Instagram or on a YouTube show. I think golf should use you more um, to, you know, sp spread the fact that golf is fun. Golf could be for anybody. And, you know, and for women's golf, it should be, you know, they should use the power of, of what the Internet's used for. Um, to promote the game in every way possible. And I think it's, uh, I think you've done a great job for younger women coming up who want to, you know, uh, give tutorials on an Instagram or do tick. I don't even understand TikTok. TikTok is crazy. Yeah, my TikTok game's weak. Do you have TikTok right now? I do. So I got into it during like quarantine 2020. And um, 
I was like trying to do all like the dance trends and everything. And then like a couple months passed and I was looking back on like, what did I do? <laughs> like this is up forever. I can't believe I did that. But yeah, I know it's difficult because you have like TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all of these different platforms in my podcast. And you just feel sometimes overwhelmed by having to like create all of this content. And, you know, I just try to make it as fun as possible. I think sometimes, you know, content creators get so like obsessed with it and they almost become like they feel like they're more famous than they actually are and they take themselves too seriously and I try to do the absolute opposite of that with all my content I think that definitely comes through and you know I just try to create things that like my best friends would think were funny or that they would like and and I think that's something that golf needs because at times it can be a bit stuffy and conservative and you don't really have anyone being outspoken about you know certain issues in golf or you know um, how exclusive it is at times or you know the other side of golf with how fun it is I mean you guys know you go out there with your buddies on like a twilight round you're just like drinking and gambling and it's the best time ever and people don't see that side they just see like the country clubs where everyone's just wearing polos and buttoned up I'm like that's not golf like golf is just a bunch of like uh degenerates you know out there just like (laughs) drinking and like having the best time and I try to show like more of that side like the fun side of it and you know that anyone can play and it's not that expensive and it and and it is accessible because that's how kind of I grew up playing uh, and that's awesome, Paige. And I agree with everything you just said. We got the music playing out there, <laughs> yeah. gambling, drinking. Grab a dog on the turn. Grab a dog on the turn. <laughs> and yeah. speaking of gambling, Paige, my good friend Scotty Upshaw here, he likes to take my money. He likes to get in my pocket. And when I am beating him, he likes to press me on, you know, 17 and 18. Oh, yeah. So my question to you is, if we ever played a match, do you play for money or what's your gambling? Do you like to play for a lot of money or different stuff? What do you play for on the course? I do like to play for money, but I've been in some situations where um, I've been playing against guys who have like a shit ton of money and, you know, they're like, okay, we're going to play this, play this. And I'm like, okay, I can take them. It's good. And I go in my bag and like dust flies out, you know, the money pocket. I'm like, shit, I don't have any money. Like, what am I going to do? So I play for, I definitely play for money, but not like where some people play for. I love fun games. Like snakes, really fun. Pick and wolf is fun. Um, Really just anything like all I think that makes golf like when you have that competition, you have something on the line. That's what I like to do the most. Yeah. Paige, speaking of betting, um, you've been a big spokesperson for points bet. Yes. Uh, could you give us any sort of increment on how you like to bet on golf, pick like, you know, pick players, who do you look for? And like, there's a lot of ways we could bet this Ryder cup this weekend. And yeah. we'd love Help to help us out Paige. Yeah. So like, <laughs> how, how do you structure that? I, I, What's and and do you get to pick some of the bets? Like, can you actually put like different plays up there? That's always cool. I always find like, hey, you know, I'm gonna bet that this guy has the longest drive today or whatever, and just see kind of how yeah. it plays out. But I guess, how do you like to bet at golf? Yeah, no, it's been really fun working with points bet. Uh, we have a name of bet feature, so you can actually put in whatever bet you want. So I'll do one every week for people, and we'll boost it, which is really exciting. We're gonna do one for the Ryder Cup this week. You know, it's really difficult betting on golf and it was hard this season because we had so many shock winners with like you know phil mickelson winning the pga a lot of first time winners and so you never knew what was going to happen and i actually had a pretty good track record on my picks and it's i pick off of like a gut feeling because i feel like when you go by like the numbers and the stats with golf it doesn't really matter at all so you just have to look at like the golf course and golfers are so particular with like what courses they play well on and what courses they don't like so if you just look at the past history and you see that okay like kevin no he's super predictable there's five courses that he can win on he even said that so that's when you want to put you know a lot of money on him to get a top 10 or a win so you just have to kind of look at like the patterns of the players and that's how I like to make my picks the best so like going into the Ryder Cup this one's hard because you're up they've won nine of the last 12 so obviously you're thinking Europe's gonna win but for USA we have six rookies and that might seem like a disadvantage but the last time we had six rookies was 2008 we ended up winning and they're also playing incredible right now We have a higher ranking, so USA should win based off of, like, um, rankings. I mean, everything that they're doing. And also, Steve Stricker, he didn't pick off of experience. He picked off of who was going to play well at Whistling Straits. So, pick guys who can hit it long and can putt well. So, if you look at our team, USA should win. 
but you have the drama between Brooks and Bryson and uh, Brooks and DJ and Patrick Cantlay and Bryce. I mean, everyone kind of just has like a thing right now. So I don't know how that's going to affect it. And the Europe guys are just like, so they just gel perfectly and they seem to, you know, rise to the occasion. They're good match play players. But I think with the travel ban and, you know, there's going to be so many people rooting for USA that it's going to be really hard, uh, I think, for the European team. So I don't know if I really gave you a pick because I'm still like on the fence about that. It's kind of very long. Yeah, that was great. Like, no, listen. I don't know answer. No. I mean, in my heart, I'm USA all the way. But I, I think that, you know, Europe, they're they're still the underdog based off of odds. So, you, I mean, it's a, it's a good pick for that. But for like on points bet, we have odds on everything. So uh, rookie, points leader, um, records, like day one, all of it. So if you want to go check that out, you can. Uh, but I think it's going to be a really, really good Ryder Cup, and I think it's going to be close this year. I mean, what a pro! Yeah, I mean, hey, listen, you just, you just like that's a scouting report. <laughs> Whose bag no, are you pay, carrying pay, this? Pay, yeah, Whose bag are you carrying? Because that probably the guy would probably win. Paige, <laughs> everything you just said is bang on. Listen, I'm a golf nerd, Paige. I watch Golf Channel all the time. It's just something I know. I got a, I got a disease. But listen, everything you said, I agree with. I just think like what you said about Team USA and the morale on that. Um, team room. I think if they get off to a bad start, they could be in trouble. Would you agree with that? I think if they go out and win the first, I think it's what four ball first or maybe whatever. I don't know if they do well there. I think they're okay. But if you see some adversity, what you just mentioned, I don't know. That could be the the defining, you know, which way it goes. You know, I'm almost the opposite as you. I think if they come out and they're behind, they're really going to get fired up and that will motivate them. Yeah, Again, yeah. I think it's just going to depend on like how the team's gelling. Uh, we saw, you know, Brooks and Bryson kind of talk it through yesterday, but I don't know if that was just for camera. Yeah, so it's going to be really interesting, but I am hoping that they get paired together. This is a hill I'm going to die on, but I think they would be an unbeatable duo because they both love winning and they both love controversy. And I think they would thrive playing together and like having, I mean, cause if they're playing apart, I still think people would be yelling Brooksy at Bryson, but if they're together, <laughs> it doesn't matter if they're yelling Brooksy, you don't know who they're yelling for. Wow. So I think that's like a perfect team for them to be together. I mean, there's nothing that could go wrong. That's coming from a media girl too. That's so that's just has all the making for just like te <laughs> television. That it's is great television. for television. And DeChambeau page kind of insinuated that that might happen, but what a great call by her for those knuckleheads that are drunk calling them. Brooksy, if they're playing yeah. together, fucking you don't know, you don't know yeah. who you're talking you to. Yeah, so it's perfect. Steve it's perfect. Stricker, I think they should be paired together. If you're listening, Steve, Paige has got the answer for you. That might that could be the play, up dog. That could be the play. Uh, so our boy Max Homa won last week. Paige, he's he's a legend. Uh, what do you think of Max's game on well on the golf course and right. on Twitter? Because he's insane and he uses it to his advantage and. I love it because I think more guys should do that, but not everyone has a personality like that. He's funny. He's witty. He engages with all the fans like yourself. He's better for the game. Uh, so have you met Max? Yeah. So Max and I are good friends and um, was at his wedding. Like I love Lacey. Like they're just amazing. So I love team home. Uh, but I, I played with Max before and it's funny because he just doesn't miss fairways at all. Like he'll be mad if it's like a yard or two off of the center line. And the last time I played with him, he just walked out and shot a 62. Like it was nothing. And those guys are so good. And he has the game to do it. He's one of like the best ball strikers. His swing is so mechanically sound. Uh, he's a good putter sh struggles a little bit around the greens, but I think that's improving a lot. So if Max has the belief in himself, to, you know, compete at that high level, I think he's going to be unstoppable. And we're starting to see that more, um, you know, when he won at Riv and he just won again. And I think he's going to compete really well at majors because he plays well on, you know, big boy golf courses. And that kind of like fits his game. So I think once he gets his first major win, he, I mean, the floodgates are going to open for him. And he's just such a good guy too. And, you know, we see athletes, but mostly in golf, I think because it's such a conservative sport that they're so worried about what they're going to say all the time. Because, you know, you even see it with like, Brooks or Bryson, they say one thing that's not even that bad and just everyone talks about it and they blow it out of proportion. So I can see why golfers decide to maybe not be as active on social media, but he connects with so many people and he does it in such a smart way where it's not controversial. He's just funny. And, you know, he has a really great personality and he has this huge fan support because of what he's done on social media. And I think that's a good blueprint for a lot of young players coming up that you can balance being, you know, active on social media and a winner. 
It's not one or the other. Cause I think people say like, if your game starts to struggle, then they're like, Oh, because you're too active on social media. And I don't see that as a thing. I mean, he's handled it perfectly. And so I think a lot of players can look to him and be like, okay, this is how I grow my brand. This is how I grow my fan base. And I can also, that can benefit me on the golf course. Cause I have all of these fans rooting for me all the time. A hundred percent. And, and Paige, I've known Max a long time. He was a member at big Canyon before he moved to Scottsdale. Yeah. And I went and watched Max play at the Canadian Open. This is years ago now, five years ago. And, you know, he bogey, bogey, double bogey, bogey. I'm like, I can't even watch him anymore. I got I to get away from him. And then he started doing Twitter and he moved to Scottsdale. And I think the social media aspect helped him gain confidence. And then obviously the way he's playing the course, but without the social media and how funny and how much people love him, I don't know if it, he would be as good as he is now. I think it truly helped his confidence. Well, yeah. I mean, when you have so many people rooting for you and cheering for you, that helps you. I mean, golf is such a mental game that if you're feeling a little down on yourself and you don't have anyone there to kind of lift you up, then you're going to keep, you know, go on that bogey train. But if he has a bogey now and he has, you know, thousands of people around him screaming his name and, you know, lifting him, him up, like that's definitely going to help him. So yeah, I think like having that support through social media has really transformed his game and given that confidence because we would joke, he's like, yeah, I would be out there and people think I'm like Dustin Johnson or like, <laughs> you know, Patrick Kale or all these other players. He's like, but now I go out, I'm like, I'm Max Homa. Mm, and that's cool yeah. to have that confidence and know that people are like, care about what you're doing and they're rooting for you. It can be a lonely time in between the ropes when you just flub a couple in the bunker. <laughs> I felt <laughs> I'm like, oh God. I felt so bad for like literally Paige was at the Glen Abbey and like it was later in the day and I think it rained so it was a rain delay and I'm like I'm gonna go see Max play and like listen I slashed it too and I just felt so bad for him at that particular moment and from where he's went from that moment to now I mean it's amazing he's awesome on Twitter I mean I, he's just such a nice guy as you know so I couldn't be happier for Max Homa yeah no he, he's great he's good for the game speaking of golfers Paige Obviously, this is called missing curfew. Me and the updog throughout our NHL career, we got in a little hot water at times for stuff off the ice. <laughs> Golfers sometimes get a, you know, I don't want to use the word nerd, but sometimes they're not like fun guys. What golfers throughout your time have you either played with or party with or had a beer with or a glass of wine that are that pop out that's fun guys? Well, it's funny because before we started this interview, you were like, hey, what, you know, golfers have slid in your DMs. <laughs> I would say no golfers, but a ton of hockey players <laughs> out of all of Sports. It was hockey 100% of the time. And I'm like a huge oh, hockey fan. So it was great for me. But it was like hockey all the time. Like I would go through my DMs. It's just like hockey player, hockey player, hockey player. <laughs> well done, boys. Yeah, good job, oh, boys. Way to, way to make us proud. <laughs> uh, but for golfers, uh, they're all really cool. I think sometimes they choose to like not show their personality that much. Like you look at someone like a, a Patrick Cantley. Like I don't. Um, know him personally, but I've heard he's like so funny and so charismatic when you're with him. And, you know, people don't see that side of him. There's just, they're cool. They're fun. They like to have a good time. And again, you just, they don't show that side of them. And I hope that they do a little bit more because I think that they have a lot to offer. And I think they're going to do that, you know, hopefully that Netflix series where it's kind of like the formula one show. And I think that's going to really help, you know, give that inside look to like what they go through, um, their personal lives and because they're fun, all of them are so much fun and, um, no one sees that side. They just see again, like that buttoned up, you know, um, kind of robotic person on a golf course. And you don't see, you know, when they're getting trashed on a Saturday night or, you know, just having a good time and being normal. Like they just never show that side of themselves. They don't see them in old town in Scottsdale. Do they Paige? I'll tell you what, hey, that place will get you. It oh, sure gosh. <laughs> Paige, speaking of, uh, of Scottsdale and hockey, considering we're a hockey show, um, the Phoenix Coyotes are ending their lease in, in Glendale, thankfully. I've always said since I played there that it's not going to work. And if they want to grow the sport in that place, it, it needs to change. And at one point, um, we had like, you know, uh, over on the Highway 101 on the other side of town, where the new baseball stadium went yeah. up for spring training, we were like, Shane Doan actually had like a shovel in the ground at one point, like ready to <laughs> dig like for our new rink and they kiboshed it. Uh, but now there's talks that it's going to move to Tempe. What do you think being in Scottsdale for, for as long as you have, what do you think that will do to change the way people talk about hockey, go to hockey games? Um, that area of town is fun, right? College town. So what do you think that'll do for the game of hockey in, in Arizona? Selfishly, I hate it because I could, you know, sit 
right by the glass and get like a $10 ticket when I wanted to go there. <laughs> and it was the best thing ever. Like I love to go to the games there, but you're right. There was really no one there. It was, it's out of the way. It's hard to get there. And I think it's the best thing uh, for the Coyotes and just for the game. I say this all the time, but watching hockey live, there's nothing better. It's the best sport to watch live. And I think when people go and they experience it, they're going to be lifelong hockey fans because I think it's the best sport out there and especially to watch live and so I think to have like they could do college nights having all the college students there it's going to be crazy almost kind of like that Vegas night atmosphere where it's like they make it into a show to you know it's it's more than just the sport it's entertainment and that was lacking before and I think it's going to be so much better now yeah that's a great point and that's what I said when I first started playing the NHL I played in Anaheim and then I went to Tampa and I met some people that never seen hockey I'm like whatever you do for the first time do not watch it on TV go to the game yeah. Um, it's just so much better. Hopefully there'll be a couple fights, some big hits. It's even when I've only been to a couple hockey games since I retired Paige, but when I walk into the arena, I'm like, holy shit. This yeah. is, I missed this. It's the smell. It's yeah, the feel. Like, I'm it's like, the sounds. Is, it's, you know, it's everything. Yeah. And, and the speed. And if you sit on the glass, uh, I, man, you know, I, it's, I would be distracted by the way. <laughs> Hockey's hard enough, Paige. <laughs> Don't sit on the glass for the boys. Don't totally. sit on the glass. Up, you wouldn't have been able to play. He would have been minus four that night if you sat on the glass. I mean, it's like the <laughs> Vegas Golden Knights. They literally put up like you know the girls dancing at those clubs, like in the and they have these full costumes on and they're in the glass and warm ups. And you're like, how the hell do we even get ready for this game? Yeah, like, who this we playing great. again? Who yeah. we playing? <laughs> the girl's got peacock things on her hat. Like what the? <laughs> she's wearing no clothes. What the yeah. fuck? I, I was a good strategy by Vegas though. Game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs uh, or Stanley Cup finals, they did that. So I'm like, that's. I go if Uppy and me would have been playing that game, we would have probably had a sluggish start. Sluggish that's, start. So. That's tough. Paige, what what course do you play at Scottsdale? I when COVID first hit, we were out here in California. They closed down Big Canyon, and without golf, I was like, I'm going to lose my mind. So we came out, me and Joffrey Lupul, and played uh, Greyhawk, Troon, um, mm -hmm. TPC. So where where do you play in Scottsdale? I mean, there's so many great golf courses here, and there's something for everyone depending on their budget. I mean, we have really great. Uh, private courses like Silverleaf is one of my favorite. Estancia is amazing. Then you have kind of like next level like Greyhawk and Troon. But I'm a Muni girl, so I like the ten dollar golf courses. I can wear whatever I want there. Like that's important to me because I need to wear my tank tops and my short little skirts, and I need to go to a golf course that will let me do so. So I play like Silverado all the time. It's like one of the best public golf courses in Scottsdale. It's just such a fun track. Uh, they're the best people there, and I literally out there every single day. All right, folks. There I you, love there it. You have it for She's the boys. a uni girl. Yeah, for I love the Canadian it. listeners, we got everyone loves Scott still. I mean, for one reason I or enough, it. if you love hockey or if you love a boys trip to go out in Old Town, Scott still is the best. So now you know where you can go golf. The only problem now, Paige, I can't play golf hungover anymore. Like, I, I really can't do it. Like, I just, I used to be okay at it, but if I'm hungover, I don't make it, do I, Uppy? So I got to stay at Old Town if I go on a Scott still golf trip for the first couple of days. I got to stay at totally. Old Town. And you just gotta keep drinking, then. I know, what Paige. I know. God, I know. And Paige, right. to touch on you enjoying to wear whatever you like at a golf course, I think that that should change, and it should be way more, especially at like these private clubs yeah. where you pay tons of money to join. Um, you know, I was telling you yesterday that uh, I work for Discovery Land Property, yeah. and I'm sure you've been to a couple of our properties for some tournaments and stuff. But we do have to get you out there because Obi and I get to wear our board shorts and t-shirts. And hell, no shoes. Tequila and, everywhere. And tequila everywhere. So you kind of get everything you need. You get the booze. You get the laughs. You get, you know, wear whatever the hell you want. And I just think that's how golf uh, can change for the better. I agree. So uh, well, anyway, hey, we appreciate you coming on. I got one more question. On. Yeah, hell yeah. Paige, this is awesome. Thank you so much for doing this for us. We know you're busy. Of course. And speaking of busy, we don't have to plan it, but me and Uppy versus maybe you and a partner of your choice someday. We'll come to Scottsdale. I know you're a busy girl. Think it over. No pressure now, but maybe we could do it maybe for some charity or whatever. It could be fun, but thank you so much. My last thing, if you had to pick one person for the Ryder Cup, who gets the most points for USA? Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. I know that's kind of... Yeah, that's a hard one. You know, I am... I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised by Harris English. I think he's going to be... Harry. Uh, he's, yeah, I, I look out for him. Okay. I think um, you could throw some money on him. I think he'll be a surprise. Uh, Ian Poulter on the European side as well. Always look out for him, Sergio. But again, like we have so many rookies that it's kind of hard to 
it's unpredictable. So I don't know how a lot of them are going to play. And like the teams, uh, Justin Thomas is always, you know, firing those situations. He's another good one. But again, I, I think that uh, Harris English is going to be sneaky good. Love it. Great pick. Um, and just to touch on a charity, you know, and we'll do it for the yeah. golf, that'll be our bet. Let's do you do work it. with a charity? Do you have a foundation? Anything you'd like to to say yeah, that we I, could support? Um, I work with Cyber Smile, which is an anti-bullying organization. I'm working with them for... Gosh, uh, five years now. So there's someone I love to support. Great. And I'm sure everyone that listens to our podcast already knows your podcast, but what is it again for our, for our listeners? I'm sure they already listen, but what is it again? <laughs> yeah, it's a playing around podcast. We drop episodes every week, so you can go check that out uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Awesome, Paige. You're amazing. You're good for golf. Big fan. Thanks for doing this up dog. What a pull. I got Europe, Paige. Go Europe. I'm sorry. I'm Irish. I'm cheering for you. <laughs> I'll let it slide this time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, right, Paige. Thank Up dog. Canada dips, baby. Um, I got a lip boomer in right now. I think I got. Let me check. What do you got in the pocket let today? Me Oops. Check what I got. Oh, yeah. For the Broadway, I got the tangy citrus flavor because he liked that and the mango. Remember? You know what I love about there these tins is that it. you can just snap it. I feel like I'm in junior hockey here again. Hey, just and snapping it around. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, man. You know what? You know, I always have it in my back pocket for, for golf. It, it sits balances in, you out. Balances me out. Sits in there well. Tangy citrus. Mango were the Broadway's favorites. I like them all. I mix and match them. I go American Spice, Winter Green. You put, I put it all together. Um, promo code. Curfew, Curfew Cali, Cali, baby. Get it in you. I suggest you do the O'Brien. Five California rolls. So five times five. 25 tins. Coming at you, promo code curfew Cali to the candidate boys. Thank you for everything the last month. You guys have been solid. Good team guy, glue guys, up dog, lip boomers. www.canadipcbd.com. Promo code curfew Cali. Curfew Cali. Up dog. Um, First of all, great show, great Oops. fucking show. Michael Rupp, show. Rupper, thank you. Um, Paige was unbelievable. Uppy, thanks for getting her. Um, she's great for the game. I didn't know she's a big hockey fan. The DM things about hockey players was unbelievably hilarious. And listen, I didn't have the nuts to say it when she was on camera. I slid her DMs back in the day <laughs> and crickets, buddy. She never got back to me. I'm I, like, come on, Paige. I mean, like, listen, she wasn't even that famous. Like, she was getting famous. I'm like, you always told me this when we were playing back when we were single days. You're like, they have a certain number of followers, all but you can get at them. So yeah, I like tried. Like 10K or less. Yeah, I tried and crickets. But I, I think you probably slid in there too, didn't you? I mean, I feel, yeah, I feel kind of old saying this because DM world has been around for a while now, right? And it's changed. And I'm sure the young kids in the NHL are, are killing it. Are, they're, they're picking up girls in ways that we can't even imagine, right? We don't have to go out we anymore. We were kind of old school when we were doing it. We but like anyway. to chase it. We like to chase it ups. I could have called it when she mentioned the sports, like which sport. I mean, hockey guys, some guys are just ruthless. And well, it's funny. I guess hockey guys, that's our move because I won't name the kid who, who it is, but a friend of ours at a golf course, his son, anyways, is dating a very famous girl. And I guess hockey players were sliding into his DMs, his girlfriend's DMs. He's like, I played golf in my big canyon for nine holes. He's like, hey, I got these three hockey players <laughs> DMing my girlfriend. So maybe that's the hockey player move. So I had a move that I used and Let's it was it. actually on page. Yeah, yeah. And this is how we began to know each other. And we've only met each other in passing. And, uh, but anyway, so I don't know where I seen this host, but it is legendary. <laughs> I took a screenshot of my contact like for us a, a new person and i put in page and i had a golfer emoji and i had a smiley face oh wow and then lovely. i had an empty email and an empty phone number but i screen capped it okay so my intro into the dm was hey page can you kindly take a moment out of your time and fill out this contact list for me <laughs> thanks scotty <laughs> and it was it was basically the name was in their page smiley face and golfer emoji and then you know an empty telephone number and yeah, that's she unique. wrote me back that's how you get noticed laughing and at the time we she described actually how she took off on instagram and this was this was kind of early like i was living in scottsdale she was there uh i don't know who oh, kind of introduced yeah. me to, but yeah, I did it and it worked and we were kind of just kind of went back and forth forever. Um, and 
I to this day it was one of the funnier things I've ever yeah. sent out, and it and it worked. And now we, you know, now we're she friends, was, and she's on our podcast. Was, so we're gonna try to play her in, yeah. in golf. She was awesome. Uh, to the hockey players out there, <laughs> way to make us proud. Boys keep sliding in there. <laughs> you never know. Um, obviously, beautiful. You know, she's a beautiful woman. She has a great golf swing. But I was blown away. Um, very educated about the game. We asked her questions about the Ryder Cup, who to bet on. Boom, like a pro, like boom, boom, boom. So um, we've been looking to do some golf thing here at Missing Curfew. Maybe me and you take on her and our girl, girlfriend of ours for some charity. Um, but thanks to her, Oppie, thanks to you. Um, thanks to Hall Pass Media, our new studio set up here. Our boy Broadway, Jimmy Hayes, looking over us. Uh, Oppie, it's been a tough little month for us here, fella, but it was good to be back with you in the studio. Hockey's right around the corner. Ohana Fest, my morning jacket. I can't wait. Well said, Obes. Great to be back in here. Fans, thank you for listening to our sponsors. We yeah. appreciate your help. And uh, season two begins, and hockey's right around the corner. <laughs>